was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good morning and welcome to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. And I'm with you live from 10 until 1. Coming up in this hour, Rishi Sunak has urged Conservative MPs to stick with him, telling backbenchers that the economy is turning a corner. This comes amid rumours that Commons leader Kemi Mordaunt is leading a plot to oust the Prime Minister before the next election. We'll try to get to the bottom of all of that. Plus, Defence Secretary Grant Shapps has accused Vladimir Putin of being a modern-day Stalin after a sham election in which the Russian president won a fifth term in office with a landslide, 87% of the vote. Why not go for the full 99, Vlad? And local councils will need to get local residents' approval for low-traffic neighbourhoods and 20-mile-per-hour zones or face being stripped of powers to fine motorists under new government guidelines. But why haven't they brought them in already? First, though, let's get the latest news headlines with Emily Rose Adams. Good morning. The business secretary has dismissed suggestions that a large number of Tory MPs on the right of the party have been holding secret talks in a plot to replace Rishi Sunak. Sources suggest they're looking to crown Penny Mordaunt as their new leader if the Prime Minister faces a confidence vote in the coming weeks. However, Kemi Bade-Knox told the BBC only a small minority felt like this. Well, Talk TV's political correspondent Alicia Fitzgerald says the party is clearly split. There are definitely talks that are taking place between various factions within the Conservative Party at the moment, potentially about ousting Rishi Sunak. Whether or not everyone is united behind Penny Morden, like, like the news is saying, that's a bit more uh, up for debate. Lots of people still really backing Kemi Badenoch to be the next leader, and lots of people still very much saying that they need Rishi Sunak to lead them into the next election. Vladimir Putin has claimed he's won Russia's election and now extends his rule as president for six more years. Early results last night claimed the leader, who's ruled for nearly a quarter of a century, won nearly 88% of the vote. However, no credible opposition candidate was allowed to stand. Well, Ukraine's president Zelensky said Putin's drunk with power and is doing everything to rule forever. And Professor Scott Lucas, international politics professor at University College Dublin's told Talk TV the election wasn't at all credible. Look, you know, these, these were stage-managed elections. Uh, the Kremlin is in control, control of almost all Russian state media. Any legitimate challenger, especially one who criticized the Kremlin's policies or the invasion of Ukraine, was barred from standing. This was simply a formality, not only to proclaim Putin a victor with 87.5%, but a turnout of more than 70%. The Israeli military has confirmed this morning it's carrying out a raid on the Al-Shiva hospital in Gaza with reports of tanks and heavy gunfire nearby. The IDF says it's focusing on a high-precision operation in limited areas of the hospital based on intelligence indicating it's being used by Hamas fighters for terrorist activity. And eyewitnesses have described a state of panic inside the building in Gaza City. Detectives have marked the 15th anniversary of the disappearance of university chef Claudia Lawrence with a plea for those with information to come forward. The 35-year-old was reported missing after she failed to report for work at York University in March 2009. Her disappearance has been treated as a murder and the case had become one of the best-known unsolved crimes of the last 20 years. Police insist the inquiry is not closed. I'm fully aware of the complexities that exist in this inquiry, which sadly we have to treat as, as one of suspected murder. However, the single barrier to unlocking the answers for Claudia's loved ones and bringing those responsible for her disappearance to justice remains the same in my view. Britain's most successful female Olympic athlete, Dame Laura Kenny, has announced her retirement from cycling. The 31-year-old's won five Olympic golds and seven World Championship titles. She gave birth to her second son last July and will not compete at this year's Olympics in Paris. 
And experts claim an artwork that appeared overnight in Finsbury Park in London was done so by the street artist Banksy. The work, which shows a mass of green painted behind a cutback tree to look like foliage, has a stencil of a person holding a pressure hose next to it. The artist himself is yet to reveal if he was behind it. That's the latest. Now time for a look at today's weather with Nazneen Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, it's a sunny start to the week for most of the UK. We're going to see plenty of sunshine through this afternoon. A few passing showers, though, across central and eastern areas of the UK. And before the day is out, we will see wet and windy weather spread to western parts of Britain, as well as across Northern Ireland, where it will be a pretty wet afternoon. But where the sunshine is, with the southerly winds as well, it will be very mild for the time of year. Temperatures above average, locally up to 17 to 18 degrees Celsius. This time of year, we usually see highs of around 10 or 11. Now, overnight, the wet and windy weather will continue its journey further eastwards across parts of Scotland, northern and western England and Wales, and more wet weather will spread across Northern Ireland too. But for for the East Midlands, Central, Southern and Eastern England, it will be mostly dry. And everywhere will have another mild night with temperatures staying in double figures. Then through tomorrow, that rain will continue its journey further eastwards across England and Wales, um, becoming lighter and patchy in nature as it does. So more like summer light showers here and there. Again, plenty of sunshine developing. And again, it will be another very mild day, a drier day for Northern Ireland. The temperatures again will be up to around uh, 13 or 14 degrees Celsius. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. No, sir. Good morning and welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer and you are with Talk TV, which you knew already. Now, joining me to discuss all of the biggest stories of the day is commentator Sam Armstrong. Good morning to you. Good Happy morning. Monday. I don't know about you, everyone's feeling the joys of spring today. Certainly where we are, there is. <gasps> Sunshine. You remember, there's this yellow thing in the sky, and 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 it, it feels a bit warmer. It's don't, not pouring don't, down. Don't jinx it, Julia. Sorry. No, what no, have no. I just done? <laughs> this is going to be a hurricane later now, isn't there? <laughs> anyway, we're full of the joys of spring, and it would appear so are some Tory MPs because yes. If in doubt, not quite sure what to do on a Monday morning, have another attempt at a leadership contest at Tory party. It's kind of their sort of every six months sort of hobby uh, these days. And that is what I'm asking you about today, because Rishi Sunak has urged Tory MPs to stick with him because the economy is going to bounce back. And before the next general election, it's not going to happen on May the 2nd. I want to know, should they keep Rishi Sunak or should they ditch him for another leader? If you think they should ditch him, Tell us who they should ditch him for and why that person you think might have a better chance. Give us a call, 0344 499 1000, text on 87222, or you can get in touch on X at Talk TV. Calls to charge at the national rate, text cost one, standard network rate message. Um, Sam Armstrong, um, look, this has all come about because there's latest stories over the last few days about a plot. Now, we were told originally it's a plot by Penny Mordaunt, who's very much on the sort of the one nation. Uh, Tory side, um, she was leader of the Commons, her of carrying a sword very, very well and the great hair, neither of which, as admirable as they are, those abilities and traits, necessarily are qualifications for being Prime Minister of, a, a, of, of this country. Just throwing that out there. But lots of talk that she is, you know, leading this move to try and oust the Prime Minister, partly because she's got a seat that could well be gone in the next general election. Then we heard at the end of last week, no, 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 she was being used as a stalking horse by Tory MPs on the right who were just going to cunningly push her to try and oust the Prime Minister and then they'll stand their own candidate. She has yet, as far as I'm aware, to come out and say, no, 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 nothing to do with me. Um, what is going on? You, you know an awful lot of Tory MPs. You work with the new Conservative group, group on the right. What is going on? Well, it's undoubtedly the case that last week there was a vibe shift amongst MPs in which they changed, I, I think, from uh, a, a position of uh, resigned defeat for some of them, uh, I, I confess, to actual upset and anger with um, what was going on. What, what changed? What with the leadership. Far and away, the biggest factor was Lee Anderson defecting. There is okay. a, a serious belief... Uh, uh, 
that I have picked up amongst MPs that that reflected a judgment error on the Prime Minister. Now, putting you in a position where, look, if you don't apologise for what you said about Sadiq Khan, you're, you, you're staying without the whip and basically leaving him nowhere else to go. MPs on the left believe it was a mistake to appoint Lee Anderson deputy chairman to, make, to increase his profile in the first place, and MPs on the right believe it was a huge mistake to fire him. Right. Neither side is right now happy, and I think the Prime Minister has got to show some, some really clear, really quick action to seize control of, of this story, because in the newspapers over the weekend, the smallest character in what is going on in the Conservative Party was Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister. And that's not a sustainable position. No, exactly. He's just being sort of swayed by the tide. But that's part of the issue, isn't it? When you're just trying to sort of, oh, keep the left happy enough, um, you know, let's appoint David Cameron to be uh, Foreign Secretary and things like that, and keep the right happy enough, or let's appoint Lee Anderson, and, then, and you're just trying to sort of be all things to all men, which you can't do. Um, and then people go, well, 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 what do you stand for? What do you think? There seemed to be some hope that the, the budget was going to be a game changer. I don't think anyone who paid any attention to our economics would have thought that it would be a game changer. It certainly wasn't. Um, but in terms of the likelihood of a challenge, I mean, look, if you think, you know, we had David Cameron, he stood down after the Brexit referendum, and then we had Theresa May. She was ousted in July 2019 uh, by Boris Johnson. He then won that resounding victory. He then gets ousted over Partygate uh, and the rest of it. We get Liz Truss, and then she gets ousted after 49 days, and then we've had Rishi Sunak. Is it tenable to go into the next election with yet another new Tory leader, another Prime Minister, or... Is the calculation by a lot of Tory MPs, I'm, I'm assuming on the right and the left, that we're so far behind in the polls, we have nothing left to lose? Yeah, there is increasingly talk amongst Tory advisers, Tory circles, about what is the flaw on Conservative votes. How low can it go? So roughly 20%. So, so they're polls currently now. bubbling along at between 18 and 20%, depending on the poll you take. If you if you squeeze the don't knows, they come up to about 26, 27%. But in in seat terms, in Westminster seat terms, that means that they will be on 150 seats. The Labour Party will have a majority of. Hundreds. Well, there was one. There was one uh, poll which was produced actually not by a polling company, sort of for public consumption, but for private companies because, of course, private companies pay for these things deliberately because they need to make plans for what their, their future. And it was worth well looking at individual constituencies, and they came up with a worst case scenario of a Labour for the Tories, very good case scenario for the Labour, a Labour majority of two hundred and fifty seats. I mean, that is out of the realms of the likely in the in the big scheme of things. We know that we know that during general election campaigns, when there's focus on the opposition, these these polls leads will narrow. We, we know all of that. There'll be more focus on Keir Starmer. Who knows what could happen? But things are looking bad. I mean they are bad. Any election tomorrow would be cataclysmic for the Tory party. There are people seriously going around talking, as we speak, about an extinction-level event, that the Conservative Party would be so badly defeated if the election result were to uh, happen in line with the polls that it would simply break up after the election into... It's not even worst case, no, they still have around 150 MPs. Well, but 150 MPs, candidly, means two, three, maybe four Labour terms. Because when you've got, as Keir Starmer, a majority that large, the Conservative Party simply won't be able to land the Now, hold on a minute. Now, that was the conventional wisdom uh, until until we saw what happened after Corbyn. Now, OK, that you're thinking exceptional circumstances, Boris, Brexit, Jeremy Corbyn, all those factors put in together in 2019. After 2019, the conventional view from the experts we hear so much about was, that was it, Labour are wiped out, they won't be in for two or three terms. Well, sorry, but everyone's looking at a Tory as not just a Labour sneaking in with a small minority, but a solid majority now. I think the, the, the old assumptions, the old rules of how these things work, I think they're out the window now. Here's the problem, though. Divided parties do lose, and the Tory party is riddled right now with divisions. And if they were to be reduced... So is the Labour Party, to be fair. They're just not sure, being focused Sure, but a on. 250 majority would, would hide that or mask that very well indeed. 
But if the Tory party goes into the next, uh, comes out of the next election with 150 seats, 75 will be on the right, 75 will be on the left, yeah. and I think there will be no more resolved in terms of okay. dealing with these intractable issues as they are now. Okay, so what, what is what do we think is likely to happen then in the next few days, weeks, months? Of course, we've got the May the second local elections and London mayor elections and other and mayor, you know Matt West Midlands and Manchester and elsewhere. Um, we know Sadiq Khan for, for the, the sitting Labour mayor of London. He's launching his uh, uh, campaign today. We'll talk about him a little bit later as well. But um, You've got those local elections. No doubt at all the Tories will do badly. It's a good chance for people who are angry to give the Tories a big kicking or stay at home, etc. Um, there's a lot of talk that over that May Bank holiday weekend, first May, you know, May Day, that actually that is when there's going to be the plotting. And look, you know, it's going to be very similar to the territory that Theresa May was in in 2019 after local elections, where it's like, look, you know, how many, you know, we had by election after by election loss. Now you're going to have massive losses in the local elections. Right, time is coming now. Is it likely there will be a stalking horse of the likes of Penny Mordaunt? Because the key thing about Penny Mordaunt is she's got, I think, a 15,000 majority in her Portsmouth seat. Uh, again, in normal times, she'd be solid to win the next election and still be an MP. Big question mark with majorities of 20,000 plus falling in by-elections, whether or not, and on the current polls, whether or not she'd keep her seat. In which case, it may be in her interest to go early. She has not come out publicly and said, look, I am not behind this plotting. I will not be a candidate. Certainly, certainly number 10 have been sort of privately blaming her. Mm -hmm. But is she someone who's seriously considering it for herself? Or is she being put up by right-wing Tories as a stalking horse so they can go, oh, no, no, we'll support you, we'll support you, Penny. But as soon as Rishi Sunak is unseated, they will then put up their own candidates. And if they do, who do they put up? Because there isn't any move to sort of coalesce around Kemi Badnock or to go around... Um, yeah, um, um, Swella Bravman or Robert Jerick. There seems to be, or, or Pretty Patel, or, or you know, tried it once, try her again, Liz Truss. I can see no real movement towards one single figure who can take the leadership. Well, I think you're right. Penny Morden's silence is deafening right now. But there was one idea that emerged in the Sunday papers for a so-called papal conclave of Tory MPs. They will all God. be locked in a room together that maybe they'll take their phones away. I think MPs, on balance, would be better off without their phones in, in any given <laughs> situation. And they would simply not leave that room until they come out with a candidate. Well, that's good. We'll get rid of a whole load of MPs for the next five years because they'll never agree. Well, what you could do is you could have a sort of knockout contest. You could set the bar under the, the Conservative Party rules to, say, 150, 200 MPs, so that only one candidate is going to meet the, the conditions, yeah. which is kind of what happened. The 1922 Committee can change the rules any time they want. Any time it wants, in any way it wants. And you could resolve the question of who's to be a Prime Minister of, of this country, and this is shocking, I think, quite rightly to a lot of people, in an afternoon, behind closed doors, with Tory MPs simply making the decision by themselves. OK, but, but again, and people take about shocking and say, like, you know, you know Liz Truss doesn't, didn't have a mandate and, and Richie Sunak doesn't even have a mandate from the Tory membership, etc. But that's not how we select MPs. MPs are the... You know, sorry, uh, Prime Minister, sorry. The Prime Minister is the is largely you know, the leader of the largest party and whoever is leader will become prime minister. There will be the pressure for an election sooner. Maybe a lot of us think we'll get it over and done with. Let's move on, because I'm like, but I do want to hear from you. Do get in touch on this. I want to hear from you whether they should stick or twist, basically. Stick or twist, because that's basically where we are in terms of the territory for the next prime minister, for this prime minister or an ex-prime minister. 0344 1000 is the number to get your calls in on that. Text talk to 87222 or you can get in touch on X at Talk TV. Um, Let's talk about another election. Ha, ha, ha. Um, we shouldn't even use the word election. The, the sham, the pretense, the, the complete joke that is uh, the, uh, the, the election to the fifth term election, a laughable term to use, about Vladimir Putin. He won a whopping 87% of the vote in the, the three days of the uh, Russian elections. Um, I keep using that word because what else do you use? Uh, he's been branded a modern-day Stalin by our Defence Secretary Grant Shapps. Uh, he's stolen the election. Uh, of course, he had opponents like Alexei Navalny imprisoned or murdered. If you, if you are opposition in Russia, you will be behind bars, falling out a window, poisoned, mysteriously disappeared. You, you know, you have not got hope in hell. Three other candidates got between them about I think, 9%, 10% of the vote. But basically, um, they were all supporters of Vladimir Putin put up by him. Here's the question. 
Why does he go through the sham election? Why does he go through the pointlessness of this when surely everyone knows this is... I mean, is he just having a laugh? Is it just sort of almost taking the mick out of everybody? Well, don't, don't try poisoning me, Vlad, for this, but <laughs> let me tell you, this is a man with the ultimate case of little man syndrome yes. I've ever, totally. ever seen. He has got an ego the size of Jupiter. He has an inferiority complex. He wishes to be one of the leaders of the world on the global stage, and he sees that in America where which he's slightly jealous about because he's not quite as important as the American president and he knows it, uh, they have these elections and he wants to say, well, we're doing it all the same. It is theatrics it in is. order to sate his ego. It's, it's offensive to me, it's disgraceful. And I, I wish on this day, actually, we could spend a little bit of time thinking about Alexei Navalny, some of the yeah. real Russian heroes that have given their lives in order to try and set, let the Russian people choose their own future. Yeah. Not the West's choice for them, by the way. Let the Russian people choose what they yeah. want. And, for and all credit to the incredibly brave souls uh, who did go out at that sort of noon for, you know, uh, uh, against Putin sort of demonstration where even if you just stood outside, uh, the, you know, the, the electoral, you know, the polling stations, that you could face arrest and people, up, up, up to 100 people were arrested. I mean, you know, careful what you wish for. People who say, oh, I can't be bothered to vote in this election. Seriously. You have no idea what the options are. Um, you know, the question is, is what he is going to do with the next six years in office, 12 years in office. He is never going to leave office. He knows, Vladimir Putin knows, the moment he leaves office, even as the richest man in the world, his power is gone, his ability to keep, protect himself and his family and his acolytes. So he is going to stay in office till the day he dies. He will, he will come out from either a heart attack or be you know, poisoned or shot by somebody. We know that. Uh, he's not leaving. So what, what, is he, what is he aiming to do with that? Because he's done a bit more sabre rattling, made it very clear he, you know, he's not ending the war in Ukraine anytime soon. Again, talked about Western aggression towards Russia. It looks very much like he is gearing up to a whole, you know, we are at war with the West, you know, dynamic. Um, we, this, is, this is always scary because, as we know, it's not just talk when it comes to Vladimir Putin. No, this is undoubtedly, and this has been a long war, in my view, the most dangerous moment we have faced yet. It, he has a real choice to face between, does he seal the deal, does he push it over? And I worry, I'm very, very, very afraid, actually, that in the next year, Vladimir Putin may seriously consider using battlefield, perhaps tactical level, but nevertheless, nuclear weapons in that conflict. And then at that point, yeah, or, you know, whether he decides to, you know, step into, you know, Georgia or, or you know, again, we know Latvian, the Latvian uh, former prime minister, now foreign minister, he was in uh, uh, an interview over the weekend talking about how they followed suit from Finland and, and organised conscription um, and basically having a, as Israel does, you train people who are required to be trained up and then... Uh, you know, you've got an army you could just call up at a short notice. Um, 250,000 Finland has, look, I mean, dwarfing what we can call up uh, for a very tiny state with a very small population. Do you think we need to consider things like conscription just to have people trained up? They then go back to normal, you know, civvy life, but to have people trained up because... I don't mean anyone who doesn't know about this stuff that doesn't think that we are entering, as you say, a very dangerous period in the West history. Well, back in the 1990s, there were some pretty uh, optimistic theorists, oh, political yeah. theorists that end were talking about the end of history, yeah. said it was all over. This is not the end of history. This is the West, the free world, entering a bleak and dangerous chapter in our global story. China could invade Taiwan tomorrow, potentially plunging in the world into a real serious conflict because the Americans would have to defend the Taiwanese against China. Yeah. Vladimir Putin, Iran, uh, terrorists in, in, in the Middle East. This is a dangerous time, and I think we all get, need to get used to the fact that we're going to have to spend more on defence, we're going to have to give more to defence, and yes, I, I suspect within the next 20, 30 years, we will have to consider things like conscription. I, like I, I would service. think within the next five, ten years, actually, much sooner than that. I'm thinking it's a lot cheaper to do it to do it now. Um, I, um, I, I also want to talk about, there's so many other things, the future, some, some of the future we talk about is very, very optimistic. Um, apparently, we're all going to be in flying taxis. Um, by 2028, drones used to fight crime. This, is, this isn't pie-in-the-sky stuff. This isn't sort of an episode of, tr of Tomorrow's World. Uh, this is actually a government document. Ministers setting out ambitious plans to overhaul current regulations and infrastructure, enable flying taxis to take to the air in 2028 and operate without a pilot by 2030. Not a chance, mate. Not a chance. No, uh, I for but one... I, that A, it'll happen, and B, that I'd go in one. <laughs> 
Yeah, and, and actually see that Sadiq Khan will let us get around London that easily in our own personal vehicles rather than being bullied, cajoled, uh, uh, forced into using TfL's dreadful tube service. He's already made driving around London impossible. Yeah. No doubt we'll have low-flying neighbourhoods um, or whatever else he comes yeah. up with. Who knows? Who knows? I, I do want to just really quickly get to something about uh, Donald Trump. Um, he has been... Um, well, also clips, lots of mainstream media is referring to Donald Trump having warned of a bloodbath if he loses the presidential election in November. A lot of clutching at pearls, a lot of clutching at pearls. Um, I don't know, have we got the clip of what uh, Donald Trump actually said? Um, because this was uh, an address to supporters at a rally in Ohio on Saturday. Um, this is the full context of what Donald Trump had to say, which is rather different from perhaps what the MSM reports have suggested, he said, bloodbath implying, you know, riots, revolution. This is what Donald Trump had to say. If you're listening, President Xi, and you and I are friends, but he understands the way I deal, those big monster car manufacturing plants that you're building in Mexico right now, and you think you're going to get that, you're going to not hire Americans, and you're going to sell the cars to us now, we're going to put a 100% tariff on every single car that comes across the line, and you're not going to be able to sell those guys. If I get elected, now, if I don't get elected, it's going to be a bloodbath for the whole... That's going to be the least of it. It's going to be a bloodbath for the country. That'll be the least of it. So he did say bloodbath, Sam Armstrong, but it was about a bloodbath for the U US automotive, automotive uh, industry, which is rather different from how it's being played I'm, out. The smug liberal media are, in this case, worse than any other example I've seen, deliberately misrepresenting the facts in order to get clicks. This is, in Donald Trump's terms, fake news. It is fake news. You know what? He says enough things that I, we think we should be worried about. You don't have to make them up, guys. You really don't. We'll talk about that a bit later as well. Now, today we're asking about Rishi Snack urging Tory MPs to stick with him because the economy, he says, will bounce back before the general election. Uh, should they keep Snack or ditch him for another leader? Who would you want? Who would do a better job? Give us a call on 0344 499 Text 8722 or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Karen has done just that and says, is this a joke? Of course he should be axed. Herbert says, uh, if they got a new leader, it would be like being promoted to captain of the Titanic 30 seconds before it hit the iceberg. Ouch. And Alex says, no, he should not be ditched. It's too little, too late anyway. You've also been getting in touch on the phones. Please keep those calls coming in. Vernon is in Staffordshire. Hello, Vernon. Hello, Vernon, All are you there? Moves. Hello. Can you hear me? I, 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 I had something in my ear. I was hoping it was Vernon. Can we go? Vernon, are you there, my darling? We have to give up. Oh, darn, we can't get him. Hopefully we'll get you back on the line and we'll get you back up a little bit later instead. Uh, anyway, more from Vernon, we hope. More from Sam Armstrong and more from me. Uh, and coming up after the break, more on Rishi Sunak urging Tory MPs to stick with him. Do get in touch with your thoughts. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. We're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs>
There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did the fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV. Now, Rishi Sunak has urged uh, consumption MPs to stick with him. He's told bank benches that the economy is turning a corner. It's about to bounce back. Inflation's going to get lower and lower, down to 2% by the end of the year. It'll all be fine by the time an election comes in the autumn. But will it? Well, this comes amid rumours that Commons leader Penny Morden is leading a plot to oust the Prime Minister before the next election. But is it her or is it people claiming it's her? Oh, she's been studiously quiet in denying this. So, uh, joining me now to discuss all this is Conservative MP Sir Geoffrey Clifton Brown. Good morning to you. Hello, good morning, Julia. Oh, now, I can see you, but I can't hear you. Have you by any chance got the uh, mute button on? No, I, I was having trouble with okay, your sound just before the break. We can't hear you in here. I... So, Geoffrey, can, can we have another go? What is going on hello. with the sound in here, folks? So, Geoffrey. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. Right. You, I, I can hear you. I was... I'm really pleased that all the production team can hear him, but it's not much use <laughs> if I can't hear him. Um, I'm going to let you. I'm going to let you try and sort that out, chaps. While well, I'm going to carry on and going to chat with Sam. Um, it's one of the... Do you know what? We started off with the joys of spring, didn't we? And you're right, I jinxed it. I jinxed it. Now, now we haven't got sound working here. Um, but there we are, joys of technology. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier about, you know, what's really going on behind the scenes. Who, who are, realistically, the runners and riders? Because Penny Morden, doing very well among voters, generally doing... Uh, compared with Rishi Snack, uh, doing very well among Tory members. I'm, I've never... I mean, no disrespect to Penny. Lovely lady. Fantastically feisty at the uh, dispatch book. I've never quite understood the appeal. What do, what do people think that she's going to bring to the party? Well, one of the big worries about Penny Mordaunt is she's never actually had a kind of meaty policy brief where she's had to set out what her ideological basis, her ideological thinking is on some of these big issues. So lots of Tory party uh, MPs are saying, is she a bit of an empty vessel? Could we end up with someone that we don't, don't uh, think or get something different to, to what we're... What we're, we're planning or, or expecting? Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's the thing. You've got Kemi Batten, you've got Swella Braverman. Kemi's still in the in the uh, uh, in the cabinet now. Of course, she's actually at an event with the prime minister. The prime minister has just started speaking uh, at, at this event, talking about uh, apprenticeships and ending red tape. But again, a lot of people go, oh, "How many times have you owned a small business? How many times have you heard that before?" Um, Swella Braverman still still considered by many outside the party to be a player. However. Within the party, I, even Tory MPs who I would have thought we were natural supporters of hers, are, 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 are not are not talking about her as a player. And there, and there seems to be quite a lot of rivalries on the right. I, I think that's true. But riding through behind her is her former junior minister, Robert Jenrick, who entered Parliament, I think it's fair to say, as a figure probably slightly of the left of the party, but took up this immigration minister post. Everyone expected him to be a moderate. Yeah. And in actual fact... 
He saw firsthand what was yeah. going on with our migration system. He went on a journey and he now could be a favourite for, as a candidate from the He's right. also cut his hair and lost weight, which is always a giveaway. Uh, by the way, if you're waiting for the, uh, our lovely MP, Sir Geoffrey Clifton Brown, we're still trying to work out the sound. Apparently, everyone in the world can hear a bot from me, which makes a conversation quite hard, even allowing for how much I yap. Um, but um, in, in terms of what you actually realistically think is going to happen, at any point, at any point at all, we could see. Um, it's Graham Brady, chair of the 1922 committee, going in to go to number 10 and saying, turns out, Prime Minister, is it the 53 MPs who signed no confidence letters? We've no idea whether there are three there. People could say they've put them in and they haven't, or whether there are 51 there waiting for another couple to come in. We, we really don't know. Ah, oh, actually, I think we have got Sir Geoffrey back. Sir Geoffrey Clifton Brown, good morning to you. Good morning, Julia. Yay, I can, can you hear, hear you. That makes life so much Brilliant. easier. Well Thank done. you so Hooray. much for persevering <laughs> with us. Right, Geoffrey, you know, what is going on? Is there a leadership challenge? And if so, who by? I think there are a small number of people who are not really thinking uh, this thing through properly. Because if you want a leadership challenge, you want another leader, you've got to decide who you want. Now, supposing we had those 53 letters that you were talking about, and we did have a leadership contest, as Sam was just saying, I can rattle off four names very quickly, as uh, Kemi, Suella, Robert Janrek and Penny Mordant, who would probably certainly be in the race, and possibly others, and there'll be no unity amongst the party as to who should uh, actually be our leader eventually, and I'm not sure that the splits wouldn't continue. So I think, actually, uh, we would be very, very foolish uh, to try and think at this stage of wanting a new leader before the election. So you think that's not the answer? Certainly that's what number 10 are pushing out. And we've got uh, the Prime Minister saying, you know, things are going to get better. I mean, you never know, they might stop a few more boats. You might get a plane off the ground to Rwanda with a, uh, you know, best case scenario, a couple of hundred people over the year. Um, inflation coming down, cost of living eases, less of an issue, and things might be looking up. The trouble is the message that seems to be coming back from the focus groups and the polling is that people have gone, even if you achieve all of that, People have said, well, you know what? You've had your time. It's 14 years. We, we, don't, we don't even necessarily think that Labour are going to be any better. But we think we're done with you guys. You had your chance and you didn't deliver. And anything you are delivering on, it, you're only doing it just because of the election coming up. And we don't necessarily trust you're going to stand by any of that. That's a fair, that's a fair reading by voters, isn't it? Well, I think if, if... Supposing we did have a change of leader, four different leaders in four years... I think the country and the world would consider the Conservative Party as a laughing stock. And I think there's another aspect to all of this. If we did have another leader, I think there'd be an incredible pressure on that person to say, well, you haven't been elected by the country. You must have a general election immediately. So I actually think having another leader would make the situation worse. You know, there's an old maxim in politics. A united parties win elections, disunited parties lose elections. So I think our, our, our party should rally around Rishi Sunak. You've given uh, some, of the, some of the reasons why things are improving. The economy is improving, inflation's coming down. Uh, he's achieved a lot with Northern Ireland. He's improved our relationships with, with Europe. Uh, education standards are rising. There's lots and lots of things that are getting better in this country. We've had two massive shocks, the economy, the pandemic, uh, and, the, and the war with Ukraine. He's calmly got over that situation, and now we're making real progress as a country. So I think we should actually think about that very carefully, think how we're going to win an election, and back him to the hilt. Well, the thing is, I mean, those are all perfectly reasonable, valid points in terms of the good points, the bad points, and, and, and lots of people would say, yeah, they understand all that. But still, they're kind of done now. And that's the issue, isn't it? There are these sort of swings and cycles that voters have and say, well, you know, we're, we're kind of ready to move on and give, give the other guys a try. You say that, you know, the Tories would be a laughing stock if they had a fourth leader. But if there was a fourth leader who could inspire people, who, who people felt was going to make big sweeping changes, you stood for something different, or perhaps, oh, I don't know, mind-blowing idea, actually put into, uh, into effect some of the policies that people thought they'd voted for in 2019 when they voted Conservative and get, delivered the 80 majority, then maybe that would happen. But as you say, you've got the right and the left completely divided. Is it, is it possibly, you know, the beginning of the end for the Conservative Party? And being a broad coalition has its strengths, but it also has its fundamental weaknesses. And actually, you've got a load of MPs in your party 
who don't really agree on very much anymore? Well, I think a number of those points would still uh, pertain if we had a new leader. If we had a new leader, this uh, sort of uh, fourth election win, uh, we want to change, that would still be just as prevalent uh, uh, on a new leader. I think what we've got to do is actually concentrate what Rishi Sunak's doing, making the right decisions for the country, trying to improve the lives of ordinary people, trying to improve our public services, which is exactly what he's doing, and pointing out, who do you want to run the country for the next five years? Somebody who is actually quietly getting on improving the country, or somebody who has a completely unproven record with no plan? And I think that's the argument we've got to keep making and then try and hope that people will hear that argument uh, and vote Conservative at the next election. The trouble is a lot of MPs who were sitting on what they thought were safe seats including, you know, people like Penny Borden, like, you know, well, well, you know, if there's a leadership election come, which they need, well, in the event of a loss, and without doubt, there will be a leadership election uh, at the end of, uh, 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 if, if, if there's a Labour government. It, at that point, like, oh, they can run for a leadership then. But lots of those MPs are now saying, I don't even know if I'm going to still be an MP if we don't to make a change. I've got nothing to lose. Do you, are you 100% sure, you know, that y your seat would still remain a Conservative seat? So I think there's a number of things to say that. When you've won a, a huge uh, majority, as we did in 2019, history would say to you that it's very, very unlikely we're going to get that sort of majority again. Therefore, clearly, some existing Conservative MPs, including maybe even myself, I don't know, I'm working hard to get re-elected. Uh, I, I don't think in this uh, situation any Conservative MP can take anything for granted, and that's why I'm out working hard, very hard on the doorsteps. But the, the simple fact of the matter is we will not be, even if we win the election, not be as large a party as we are now, and therefore some of those Conservatives uh, will lose their seats, and obviously they are uh, thinking very hard what they can do to try and preserve those seats. But actually, I think almost anything they do, particularly a change of leader, okay. would make the situation worse. As Jeffrey Clifford Brown, really appreciate you joining us. Thank you very much. Indeed, very quick word from Sam Armstrong on that. I mean, look, you know, focusing minds on you're going to be out of your job, you're going to be have a mortgage to pay. What are you going to do? This is what is focusing Tory minds now. Uh, it very much is. And look, let me tell you, when Sir Geoffrey Clifton Brown in from the Cotswolds constituency is worried about losing a Conservative seat, you know they're in some real trouble. Yeah, absolutely. We are in game-changing times here, aren't we? Well, look, I'm asking you about this. Rishi Sunak urged Tory MPs to stick with him. He says the economy is going to bounce back before the general election. Should they keep Sunak or ditch him for another leader? Give us a call, 0344 499 1000. Text 87222 or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Joe says... Ah, the stench of desperation by the Tory party. Phil says the Tories should never have ditched Liz Truss. And Tim says Rishi should never have been Prime Minister. He wanted the title, but not the job. You've also been getting in touch on the phones. Let's keep those calls coming in. Sadly, we haven't been able to get Vernon back on, but we have got Kevin in Kent. Hello, Kevin. Hello, Julia. Hello. Thanks for calling in. So, um, uh, should they ditch uh, or keep Sunak? Most definitely. My take on it is, I think if you had a build around your house doing a extension and he was doing a pretty rubbish job of it, um, what would you do? Would you carry on with him? Do you let him carry on making a mess of your extension? Or do you say, right, I've had enough, let's yeah. get another builder in, someone who can do the job um, and get it done properly? Right. So you'd, you'd ditch him? I'd ditch him, yeah. Who for? I would go for... Um, Penny Morden or Robert Jenrick. Oh, OK. Now, they've got quite different views on, on a lot of different things. Why those two? I just think that <laughs> whenever they talk, they seem to talk a lot of things. Um, you know, Penny Morden thinks, uh, has said twice on record that trans men are men, trans women are women. Is that, uh, that's not the kind of sense I'm looking for. Yeah, I think so. I think that's, that's, a, that's a valid point. But I just think we need someone to... to take control and I think she would do that. that they, I've always found because she could, I mean, this is it, genuine. I like Penny Morden. She's, you know, she, she's a good laugh. She's a nice lady. Got no, she, I, I dream of having her hair. I dream of having those biceps and I could hold that sword as well as she did during <laughs> the, uh, uh, you know, the coronation. However, however, all those qualifications for being prime minister. I just think that she, she's a strong lady and I think she would, she would grow into that job Okay. You know, um, really quickly. 
OK, that's interesting. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, get your thoughts in as well. Do give us a call, particularly 0344 499 Love to hear your thoughts. Coming up after the break, local councils will need to get local residents' approval for low-traffic neighbours, that's LTNs, under new government guidelines, as well as for 20-mile-per-hour zones. If they don't, they won't be able to find motorists. We'll talk about that with Together Decorations' Alan Miller up next. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer. You're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat, go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put the statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV. Now, local councils are going to need to get local residents' approval for low traffic neighbourhoods, the LTNs we've heard so much about, and those 20 mile per hour zones that have cropped up everywhere, including main roads, or they face being stripped of powers to fine motorists. Of course, how they're making most of their money these days. This is under new government guidelines published yesterday. Well, joining me now to discuss this is Alan Miller. He's co founder of the Together Declaration, who's been campaigning on these issues. Good morning to you, Alan. Good morning, Julia. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, this is this is certainly a, a big victory, isn't it? We saw these LTNs, as they're known, cropping up, particularly during the beginning of lockdown in, in, in the spring of 2020. We're like, oh, isn't this lovely? We're all cycling around and there are lovely big you know, wooden boxes full of flowers blocking off streets. Isn't this nice? The kids can play, etc. And then people had to get back to work and people had to have deliveries and people wanted to get about their major towns and cities and went, actually... Could you not? I'd like to be able to get around my local streets. Um, and councils were going, well, no, this is, this is all about the environment and cyclists and pedestrians. Um, but it does feel to me like we are winning back the right to, frankly, move along our streets. Well, um, Julia, it's a strange world where it's a victory to have the freedom of mobility. Yeah. Um, but um, <clears throat> common sense 
uh, and reasonable argument is winning in various areas. We've seen that Edinburgh Council has given up one of its LTNs, that Warrington Council has got rid of them. Newcastle, quite rightly, saw the trial. People were against it uh, uh, and got rid of them. But others are drilling down. Islington's drilling down. Tower. We've got a situation where in Hackney, um, they're saying, sorry to increase by 5% the council tax, but we're really looking after the vulnerable, like the disabled and everything. But they don't, of course, mention all their low traffic neighbourhoods. Haringey making millions of pounds within just a couple of months. We know that over two billion was spent by the government on this, but right, quite rightly, your viewers and many other viewers and supporters of Together lobbied Mark Harper, lo lobbied the Department of Transport, and they've listened. Uh, and they stopped funding active travel, which was the thing, the term like livable streets for low traffic neighbourhoods, which is really bollards uh, and cameras and surveillance. So quite rightly, they did that. And now this report is seeing how emergency services are being slowed down, how it's having a dramatic impact on local neighbourhoods and surrounding areas. Uh, there weren't that many respondents, interestingly. A lot of people feel that they've got to the point where they're not being listened to with so-called so consultations. Yeah. No, but that's the thing, isn't it? Do you think, well, are they ever going to listen? We saw, look, we saw the ULES uh, consultation in London when they, basically a whole load of people who put in their, their views against it were just completely discounted uh, by, by the London Mayor. But this is the interesting thing. Even when they do have these things, and I, I'm one of those... I'm one of those people that definitely always responds to anything that comes in on you know, local consultation because I know that most people don't. And what they do is they rally the local cycling group and the, the whatever, and they make sure that they all put all their submissions in and they go, look at this overwhelming support. Well, it turns out that uh, the average, the average uh, uh, response to a council's planning consultation on a low traffic neighbourhood plan is just 13% of residents. So even if people are not bothered by them, they ain't keen on them. They're not going, oh, what a great idea. Please do this. I can't wait for you to you know, cut off my ability to drive down my own road. We had it in our local area, one-way system, relatively quiet streets anyway, near between two main streets. And, um, and they just, and they, and they just you know, did a consultation saying, we're going to make this one street like no, no vehicles. And everyone just went, what are you talking about? No one, no yeah. one living in the street had asked for it. Where do they get these ideas from? Who do they think wants this? Well, it's a very good, it's a very good question. Where they're getting their ideas from is the uh, combination of the idea of net zero and clean air, which is presented. It, it disregards the fact that air has been cleaner than it ever has been before. And yep. on all international metrics, uh, London and the UK is far better than most others in Europe and its uh, peers. Uh, and what it does is there's a, a few uh, very wealthy green billionaires that are set on funding these so-called grassroots activists, those cycling campaigns and others, uh, alongside people like Sadiq Khan, who's the chair of C40 Cities, uh, and some others in local authorities that want to circumvent the public sphere. They want to push this agenda. It has not been debated, a cost-benefit analysis, yeah. thoroughly looked at and evaluated, and it's been imposed with all sorts of measures uh, that include fines, restrictions, and threats and nudges. And frankly, the public are not happy about it. We're going to keep challenging it. Together, we've done reports on it. We're going to be in Scotland at the end of this month for a, a Together rally, both in Glasgow and Aberdeen, where low emission zones uh, are being imp 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 like, uh, implemented. Yeah. Uh, we've seen that in all of these areas with these schemes, even when they've been implemented, the net increase there's been a decrease in cycling and walking ironically even though they spend more money on it and there has been no improvement uh in actual fact in glasgow the uh um the actual pollution went up when these things were put in place the thing is what we talk about people really want they want good services they want to be able to see a gp they want good public transport particularly in areas unlike central london where there, it isn't uh, uh, often and consistent. They want it affordable. And we want to be able to have the ability to move around, see our family and friends, to work, to be able to do that without being constantly fined, harassed, yeah. limited and, and, and just restricted. constantly seen as a cash cow. And motorists really do feel that way. I mean, I, mean, I mean, this is the bizarre thing. It's like, you know, they're bringing things like 20 mile per hour zones. Again, my local the high street, it's a red route. I mean, it's like, you know, you're not allowed to park along most of it. And they've brought it in as a 20 mile per hour zone. I mean, was there an issue on this road beforehand? No, no issue. But it means that loads and loads of people, because it's actually weirdly hard to drive along this sort of massive big road uh, at 20 miles per hour, um, because people are so used to driving it at 30, that, that um, they're making a load of money. And this is the key thing, isn't it? Councils have been spending the money on the LTNs and putting the, the wooden planters and the signs up, all the speed bumps and that, which, by the way, all cost an 
absolute fortune because I don't know who their procurement is done by, but it's clearly someone who works at the council's cousin who's making the money. Um, and then they get all this money back by fining people who break the rules, the cars that drive down the, the road, which is not, you're not allowed to drive down between th you know, 2.45 and, and 4.37 on a Monday to a Friday and things like that because of schools. And, they, and people break the rules completely unwittingly, no idea, the signs are unclear, complicated, they see them too late, and then councils are making a fortune. So the cunning thing about the government doing this, saying, look, you're not going to be able to find motorists if you haven't got support for these measures. And we all know what measures people would support. 20 mile per hour zones around primary schools in particular, but secondary schools as well, fair enough. Some like residential areas, fair enough. But the rest of it, can we all just, A, learn how to cross the road properly and, and teach our children to do the same? Put your phone down and pay attention. And let us go about our daily business. Be able to park outside the shops on the high street so we can spend our money there. Be able to park near our homes and things like that. But, but the trouble is councils have spent too long seeing us as the enemy, seeing us as cash cows, haven't they? Yeah, well, the problem is that um, the public, decent people up and down the country, are now seen with contempt. Uh, they're seen as yeah. uh, being sort of mad, bad, and dangerous. We're seen as being a problem that needs to be cleaned up, yes. uh, to be kept safe, to be told what to do. The good news is, Julia, that uh, uh, as well as the examples I've mentioned, that in Bath and Bristol uh, and Oxford and up and down the country, people are challenging and fighting back. Uh, some of them are standing in local elections. Some of them are standing in nationals, independents. Uh, and this issue about freedom of mobility, to free our streets, to be consulted properly, to be engaged with, with yeah. transparency and honesty is critical. We're going to keep uh, asserting it, the need to have our interests, our needs. And in a democratic society, that should be uh, good news for everyone. Yeah. Unfortunately, some of the people that are implementing these things want us to be quiet go in the corner and do as, uh, as we're told and they call us all sorts of names uh, which now to be honest the public's getting really bored of yeah. I think I think you're far right aren't you because you're standing up against something a local council does the key thing about the together declaration of which you're a, a, a founder member is is about when people stand together we have more power and you know make sure that our views are known um, fantastic work by you and everyone there thank you so much for joining us Alan Miller um, still with me is uh, Sam Armstrong this is the thing Tories yeah well done this is a really good move that you're doing this but a lot of people go but why did you allow this to happen for the last four years low traffic neighborhoods were a conservative policy brought in yep. under boris johnson they were a deliberate yep. decision by an advisor who has been around for a long time who cycles to work is who my cycles guess. to oh, work oh what 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 are those people who happens to live really very healthy and young and lives near lives near work how lovely for him and it has been pushed on people who have made clear again and again and again they don't want it if these policies are so good if they're so popular yeah. What's the problem with putting it all to a vote? I mean, this is the thing, isn't it? Why do they not want to do it? And we know these local council consultations, we see it with mayoral consultations as well. They know most people don't pay attention. They're busy with their lives. And it's like, oh, you have to reply within two weeks. They just go through the pile and go, oh, oh it's over, never mind. But, they, but, but we know the cycling lobby and others, they will organise and the environmental lobby, they will organise on this stuff, won't they? These people are obsessive. Just really leave are. me be in my well, car. They, hate, they don't just hate cars. They hate human beings. That's the key thing, isn't it? Anyway, coming up in the next hour, Rishi Sunak has urged his Tory colleagues to stick with him and media outrage at Donald Trump's bloodbath comments. But were they taken out of context? Short answer, yes, they were. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer, and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. 
might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good morning and welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV now. We're on TV, on radio, online, on your smart speaker, and I'm with you live from 10 until 1. Coming up in this hour, I'm going to talk more about the Prime Minister urging Tory MPs to stick with him. He's telling backbenchers the economy is turning a corner. This comes amid rumours that the Commons leader, Penny Morden, is leading a plot to oust the PM before the next election. Or is she? We'll also talk about the Defence Secretary Grant Shapps. He's accused Vladimir Putin of being a modern-day Stalin, this after a sham election in which the Russian president won a fifth term in office with a landslide, 87% of the vote. Why not go the full 100%, Vlad? And did Donald Trump really claim that there would be a bloodbath if he lost the US presidential election? Or were those comments taken very deliberately out of context? Talk about all of that. First, though, let's get the latest news headlines with Elliot Gotkin. Good morning. Business Secretary Kemi Badenoch has dismissed suggestions that a large number of Tory MPs on the right of the party have been holding secret talks in a plot to replace Rishi Sunak. Sources suggest they are looking to crown Penny Mordaunt as their new leader if the Prime Minister faces a confidence vote in the coming weeks. However, the Business Secretary told the BBC only a small minority felt like this. Talk TV's political correspondent Alicia Fitzgerald says the party is split. There are definitely talks that are taking place between various factions within the Conservative Party at the moment, potentially about ousting Rishi Sunak. Whether or not everyone is united behind Penny Morden, like, like the news is saying, that's a bit more uh, up for debate. Lots of people still really backing Kemi Badenoch to be the next leader, and lots of people still very much saying that they need Rishi Sunak to lead them into the next election. Vladimir Putin has claimed a landslide win in Russia's election, extending his rule as president for another six years. Early results last night claimed the leader, who has ruled for nearly a quarter of a century, won nearly 88% of the vote. However, no credible opposition candidate was allowed to stand. Putin hailed his win as an indication of trust and hope in him. Professor Scott Lucas, international politics professor at University College Dublin, told Talk TV it was a sham. Look, you know, these, these were stage-managed elections. Uh, the Kremlin is in control, control of almost all Russian state media. Any legitimate challenger, especially one who criticized the Kremlin's policies or the invasion of Ukraine, was barred from standing. This was simply a formality, not only to proclaim Putin a victor with 87.5%, but a turnout of more than 70%. 
The Israeli military has confirmed this morning it's carrying out a raid on the Al Shifa hospital in Gaza, with reports of tanks and heavy gunfire nearby. The IDF says it's focusing on a high precision operation in limited areas of the hospital, based on intelligence, it says, indicating it's being used by Hamas fighters. Eyewitnesses have described a state of panic inside the building in Gaza City. The Met Police has arrested a man after two people were injured by crossbow bolts in Shoreditch. Officers say a 47-year-old man has been detained on suspicion of attempted murder following a series of crossbow attacks. The victims, who suffered minor injuries, have now left hospital. Detectives have marked the 15th anniversary of the disappearance of university chef Claudia Lawrence with a plea for those with information to come forward. The 35-year-old was reported missing after she failed to turn up for work at York University in March 2009. Her disappearance has been treated as a murder and the case has become one of the best-known unsolved crimes of the past 20 years. Police insist they haven't closed their investigation. I'm fully aware of the complexities that exist in this inquiry, which sadly we have to treat as, as one of suspected murder. However, the single barrier to unlocking the answers for Claudia's loved ones and bringing those responsible for her disappearance to justice remains the same in my view. And that's silence. And Britain's most successful female Olympic athlete, Dame Laura Kenny, has announced her retirement from cycling. The 31-year-old won five Olympic golds and seven world championship titles. She gave birth to her second son last July and now won't compete at this year's Paris Olympics. That's the latest. Now time for a look at today's weather with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, it's a sunny start to the week for most of the UK. We're going to see plenty of sunshine through this afternoon. A few passing showers, though, across central and eastern areas of the UK. And before the day is out, we will see wet and windy weather spread to western parts of Britain, as well as across Northern Ireland, where it will be a pretty wet afternoon. But where the sunshine is, with the southerly winds as well, it will be very mild for the time of year. Temperatures above average, locally up to 17 to 18 degrees Celsius. This time of year, we usually see highs of around 10 or 11. Now, overnight, the wet and windy weather will continue its journey further eastwards across parts of Scotland, northern and western England and Wales, and more wet weather will spread across Northern Ireland too. But for the East Midlands, central, southern and eastern England, it will be mostly dry. And everywhere will have another mild night with temperatures staying in double figures. Then through tomorrow, that rain will continue its journey further eastwards across England and Wales, um, becoming lighter and patchy in nature as it does, so more like summer light showers here and there. Again, plenty of sunshine developing, and again, it will be another very mild day, a drier day for Northern Ireland. The temperatures again will be up to around uh, 13 or 14 degrees Celsius. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning and welcome back to the show. I'm Julia hartley Brewer, and you are with Talk TV. Still with me to going through all of the top stories of the day is commentator Sam Armstrong. Morning once again. Um, look, we've been talking a lot about this Tory infighting and whether or not there is a leadership challenge or not. Is Penny Morden doing a leadership challenge? She, is she sort of basically on manoeuvres? former Defence Secretary, after all, to try and get a, a leadership challenge together where she um, ousts a Rishi Sunak. She's been conspicuously quiet, but there are many saying, no, 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 she's not on manoeuvres. It's the right wing of the party. They are actually on manoeuvres because they want to have her as a stalking horse. Basically, she runs the challenge. They're saying, yeah, 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 we'll support her, we'll support her. But actually, they want to bring in one of their own people, whether it's your, your Kemi Badenox, your, your uh, Suella Bravman, Robert Jenrick, or, or others. Who knows who else might say? Tom Tugendhat is another name that uh, many are throwing uh, in the ring, although he's, I would say, not, not on the right of the party. Um, is any of this actually going on, or is this just, frankly, political editors desperate to find a story to, uh, to write about the Tory woes, or is there ongoing plotting? Penny Morden has had all weekend to turn around, come out and say, there's no truth to this whatsoever. I would never, ever run, uh, even if we know she ran vacancy. before. We know she wants to be Tory leader. She ran before. And here's the thing. Her silence is a statement in and of itself. Kemi Badenoch's been on the television again today. Again, you know, not necessarily being the most helpful person ever for, for the Prime Minister. I suspect all of these ministers are 
in the quiet of their private briefings with their own uh, teams discussing, going over the possibilities, what it might look like and all the rest of it. And this is the reality of the vacuum of leadership that exists at the, Conservative, at the top of the Conservative Party and the inevitable result of the dire poll ratings. Tory MPs are staring down the barrel of electoral oblivion and it's no surprise that some of them think, no, no thank you, I'd rather turn the gun on someone else. Um, well, this is the thing, isn't it? Because, you know, they're, 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 we're at a point where a lot of MPs and even MPs with what they were thought were completely safe seats, 20,000 majority, 25,000 majority, no question at all, put a blue rays out on the donkey, they're going to win. And they are now going, hold on a minute, I might be out of my seat. I'm going to have to pay my mortgage. And, you know, they've probably got the kids at private school, goodness knows what else. Um, and that they are going, hold on a minute, what, what are the options? What are the options, though? Because we just spoke to Sir Geoffrey Clifton-Brown, um, who's, you know, jury sort of, you know, shires as you can get in the Cotswolds. And, and, you know, and he was saying, look, you know, we would be a laughing stock if we went for our fourth leader in four years. However, people will put up with being a laughing stock and people mocking that if there was a bounce in the polls. It would unquestionably not be good to, to change leader a fourth time, but would it be any worse than the current situation? That's the question that Tory MPs are trying to answer. And as you say, having your career on the line tends to focus minds. And there are ministers, perhaps like Penny Morden, who no, won't necessarily be an MP after and the And this is one of the factors about her, isn't it? In her seat, 15,000 or so majority at the last election in Portsmouth. But this is the sort of seat, weirdly, which you would have thought was safe and now doesn't look so safe, in which case it, this would be her only chance. Hers is about the 280th, 290th seat that the Conservatives will retain. And right now, they are projected, according to the MRP poll a few weeks ago, to take 170. Yeah. So if you're her and you think, hmm, I'm not going to be an MP, or I can make a move now and I can not only be Prime Minister, but I can keep my seat at the end of the year because I Worth will lift try. the poll ratings. Worth and a try. I'll, I'll what about, what about uh, MPs saying, look, you know, well, it, it, uh, there'll be just a sort of, you know, uh, put the party in a holding pattern. Anyone's better than Rishi Sunak and so anyone's better than Liz Truss. I mean, anyone's better than Boris I mean, that's the territory we're in. Um, and, and therefore, we're going to an election with, an, um, with a Prime Minister, a Tory leader, um, we just see how it goes. I mean, that's not going to fly, is it? it? The one thing the country is crying out for is, um, I mean, the people who are deserting the Tories, certainly, is a change in direction, some drive, some, 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 some further, just some passion for the country. I mean, that's, I would say, well, what am I looking for as a voter? I've been a floating voter all my life. I've gone from party to party. I vote for the politics and I vote for the personalities. Luckily, I'm in a position I often get to know the people. I want somebody who believes in this country, wants to make things better, is, is not going to be sort of beholden to, I don't know, a party donor uh, or anything. I will actually do what will make life better for most people in this country and will improve the public services, will free up business from red tape. Yeah, that's some of the Prime Minister is talking about today, but no one really believes it's going to happen. We'll deal with the mass immigration issue, we'll train up our young people, we'll make sure you know, people can get NHS operations. That will involve the sort of the sort of drive, the sort of the sort of ability to deliver, to inspire, to lead, that I just don't see in anybody. I don't see it in Rishi Snack. I don't see it in any of the candidates we're talking about. I certainly don't see it in Keir Starmer. Is there anybody who who is there who can deliver that and be frankly, a good enough Prime Minister for what is a great country. And I think that's the key thing. Most British people are sitting there going, this is a great country. We need a great leader. Well, one of the great unanswered questions is the Tory party is sitting on 20 points in the polls. Reform is sitting at 14, 15 points in the polls now. The Tory party know what those voters want. They used to be Tory voters, mainly. They've now gone off to reform. They know what they want. Yet Rishi... they've told, but they've, they've told the party again and again what they want. But Rishi Sunak seems dogged. Take the immigration issue, for example. Yeah. He's made some changes on, on working visas, but you and I both know that the policies that Rishi Sunak has put in place are not going to meet the Conservative manifesto yeah. commitment uh, on net migration. Now, that doesn't require legislation. The courts can't block it. Rishi Sunak could, with a sign of a pen tomorrow, yeah. change that. 
Why, Why doesn't he? Has he decided to put himself in this position in which he's turning because his face against... Because big business has to told him we need to have all these workers because we can't get British people working. So we're paying all our taxes to fund four million people of working age not to work while paying the housing benefit for people who come in from abroad who are now competing with us for jobs, for, for GP appointments, for homes, for everything else. It is genuinely... Our economy has been run. For, for the very rich and the business, the multi -corpor multinational corporations, rather than for the benefit of the British people for the last 20, 30 years. And I think people have had enough. Right, we're going to move on. I mean, I could talk about this all day. We're going to be more, but I want to hear from you. Do tell me. Uh, I want to know, as Rishi Sunak is urging Tory MPs to stick with him because the economy will bounce back for the general election, should they keep Sunak or should they ditch him for another leader? If so, who do you want that to be? And what difference do you think that would make? Give us a call. 0344 499 1000. Text 87222. Get in touch on X at Talk TV. Calls to charge at the national rate. Text plus one standard network rate message. Right, let's get on to um, another election. But this one is a complete pretend election, a sham election in Russia uh, over the last few days. Results late last night. And Vladimir Putin giving a late night press conference after he won a well done, Vlad, 87% of the vote. I don't understand why, if you're a dictator with a pretend and comedy election, um, I mean, we, it would be laughable if it wasn't so serious, why you don't give yourself 99%. I think, I think Kim Jong-un just goes to the full 100, doesn't he? He doesn't beat about the bush. Just 100% of people support me. Vladimir Putin likes to consider himself a slightly more sophisticated dictator yes. on, the, on the crackpot circuit. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, it's, it is bizarre, isn't it? I mean, look, we've had Grant Schnapp's defence secretary, you know, he's calling him, um, you know, basically a modern-day Stalin. He's actually been in power, I think will be in power, longer than Stalin. Um, he is a dangerous man. He is right on Europe, Europe's borders. There's no doubt at all that Ukrainians take Vladimir Putin very seriously. The Poles, the Latvians, Lithuanians, the Finns, the others. Anyone, any country that's got a, a border anywhere close to Russia takes them very seriously. Do you think the rest of the Western, Western Europe is taking him seriously? We've got Macron now at France. He's now talking up the idea of maybe one day having ground operations, boots on the ground in Ukraine. That's something other European leaders and American leaders go, uh, uh, no, no, that's not what we're looking at. But do you think that that is one day going to be inevitable? Well, I... I think we need to take Vladimir Putin incredibly seriously. This is a madman with his finger on the nuclear button. But it's interesting with France and Germany. These are countries that, let's not forget, we were told are, are so much more wonderful than us. And, and when we left the EU, we were doing Putin a favour. Yeah. Germany is still funding the Russian economy to the tune of billions and billions and billions by buying uh, gas from uh, Russian oil fields that is essentially fueling, it's the only thing left that's fueling A, the Russian economy, and B, the Russian war machine. I've well, had... to be fair, they're selling a lot of their oil and gas to India and China as well. Well, they are They've now... always found a buyer. They... they... Potentially, but gas, for example, is much, much harder to export. There is no doubt that Germany has aided and abetted mm. Russia's war machine. And I just like, sometimes, sometimes our friends at the BBC and elsewhere yes. to remember that to next time that. they're lecturing us on uh, this country yes, and our morals. Certainly, but it is extraordinary, isn't it, that, um, that he goes through these processes of, uh, uh, of the Elisham election. And we say, if you're an opposition leader in Russia, as we saw with the poor Alexei Navalny, you end up in a gulag, you end up dead, you're falling out of a window um, or, or poisoned. And, and it, it is extraordinary that he does this just with impunity. Absolute impunity. Um, but, uh, yeah, really, really very, very worrying. Can we talk about something which is far less important than millions of people living under the subjugation of Vladimir Putin and sent to their slaughter in Ukraine? I mean, the Russian conscripts, I feel just as sorry for as the, as the Ukrainian conscripts. Um, but um, Kate, uh, the Princess of Wales, has, we're told, reportedly been seen at a local farm shop after going to an event where uh, the children were, were playing sports. Um, lots of the media have got a photo of Kate at this uh, farm shop. Um, and you'd be forgiven if you glanced at the news for thinking, oh, there she is, looking absolutely fine and well. That's good news after this abdominal surgery when she's still supposed to be in recovery until uh, mid-April. Um, no, it's actually a photo from a year ago. Um, I would say some of you do think a little bit sly, not, not being quite as... Uh, they know perfectly well. People go, oh, there's a picture of Kate. Now, I wonder if all this is all done in cahoots with the palace to make it look like everything's OK. This is getting kind of beyond a joke. I had, I felt as a British citizen, no need whatsoever to see pictures of Kate in her recovery from her operation. Um, she's entitled to a private life and, and to have her health matters to be kept private, as far as I'm concerned. People demanding to know where she is and things on social media are the, are the problem here, not the mainstream media just getting on with it and accepted that. Um, however, when they put out that picture that was doctored, 
set the cat among the pigeons. It would be very easy right now if Katie is in good enough nick for them simply to have a picture, a genuine picture of her at, say, this farm shop. I find it very bizarre that there was no one with a phone at this farm shop who could take a picture. Um, why don't they just do a very quick photo shoot, calm all the lunatic conspiracy theories down, and then she can go back to her recovery? And that makes you wonder why they're not doing that. Well, I think one of the problems, as we discussed last week, was that the moment you put out a photo like that, that is edited, you do lose um, the trust yeah. factor, and, and that is very difficult to regain. Now, look, I wish, I wish that people would leave the poor woman alone. It's got nothing to do with me. Um, she's obviously had a, a, a pretty serious medical intervention. She's, she's had to recover for a very long time. I'm desperate to see her back on her feet, but I do think the palace now, possibly, you're right, needs to send her out just to do a small engagement. But you'd perhaps. think that she and William, they are very clever, they're very astute on the PR. You'd think that they would have realised that now was the time to perhaps uh, uh, put something out to just quash all those rumours. Which, like, like, I, whenever I talk about this or about this, I go, leave Kayla. I'm not attacking her. I never demanded she put out a photo of Mother's Day. I never attacked her for it. I just think palace flunkies are the ones who have messed up here uh, in, in terms of what went out. I, I just think it's really bizarre they've got themselves into such a mess, given how highly paid a lot of these people are. Supposedly high-powered, highly paid, very experienced people. And they have messed up big time. If this was sort of a corporate thing, these people will be out on their ear. Well, I certainly wouldn't have a job in, in my line of work if I'd uh, got myself into this level of, of, of trouble. But the royal family have this policy, and it's long-standing, which is they, they react more slowly. Yeah. They, you know, they make, they post pictures in which there are coded messages in brochures and pictures yeah. in the background and all the rest of it, and they do it on their own time uh, and on their own terms. Clearly, I suspect that's what's going on here, but this is one of those moments I think the palace have to recognise that they've got this so badly wrong that they are going to have They're, to respond yeah. a bit they, more they, 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 they brought this on themselves. This was not, you know, this is not something the mainstream media were demanding, certainly not. Um, let's uh, also talk about um, things that are, are reported very strangely. Um, Donald Trump, it has been claimed. If you look online at Donald Trump and the word bloodbath, OK, you'll, look, you'll think the way it's being reported, and frankly, even some of the newspapers and the media in the UK, who should know an awful lot better, reporting how Donald Trump has warned of a bloodbath if he loses the presidential election in November. And very, very, very low down in some of these stories, you might see the mention that he might have been referring, he possibly, but not clear what he was referring to, but he might have been referring to the US car industry in terms of their ability to cope with uh, Chinese imports. Um, before we discuss this, Sam, let's play a little clip of what Donald Trump had to say in a speech at a rally in Ohio on Saturday, addressing his supporters, just so you can see what the context is and see if, see if you're confused at all by what the context is, when all those very, very, very clever people running mainstream media apparently are. Let's have a watch and a listen. If you're listening, President Xi, and you and I are friends, but he understands the way I deal, those big monster car manufacturing plants that you're building in Mexico right now and you think you're going to get that, you're going to not hire Americans, and you're going to sell the cars to us now, we're going to put a 100% tariff on every single car that comes across the line, and you're not going to be able to sell those cars. If I get elected, now, if I don't get elected, it's going to be a bloodbath for the whole... That's going to be the least of it. It's going to be a bloodbath for the country. That'll be the least of it. So, are you confused by what he was referring to? I mean, he didn't say a bloodbath for the car industry in the US, but I'm thinking it's pretty darn obvious. Sam Armstrong, what do you make of this? Because I think that Donald Trump says enough things that we should be worried about. Some of them are jokes, admittedly, but some of them, nevertheless, are, given what happened on January 6th and the Capitol riots, are far too close to the bone and things he said he will do and things he has done. Does, does the media really need to make up things like he's predicting or saying they're basically threatening a bloodbath, threatening violent insurrection if he doesn't get elected? The organisations, the newspapers, the broadcasters that have put this out there are not journalists. They are activists. And these are the people that hold themselves up as this kind of uh, paragon of, of moral virtue. Oh, yeah. Fake news, fake news, yeah. This was fake news. It was disinformation, it was misinformation. I think there's a unit at the Cabinet Office that they might just... Maybe BBC Verify to. could take a look at it. They would be good with that ridiculous unit at the BBC to verify the, the, even some of the things that the BBC reports. You'd think the journalists 
journalists would do that before they reported it. I must ask you about this because it is absolutely extraordinary the, what has emerged now, twice now, that when BBC has reported stuff going on, whether it's, uh, you know, a, 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 I mean, various things going on in Gaza, um, but it does appear that they are using sources who are BBC paid journalists, um, freelancers often, but Palestinian journalists, who are cannot possibly be regarded as, as neutral journalists, people who have not just... Li I'm, I'm not in favour of the... If you like tweets, I like tweets as, as a memory aid rather than anything else, but, but literally putting out tweets themselves, glorifying Hamas, celebrating October the 7th, uh, glorifying other terror leaders, in, in very, very, very biased tweets. I mean, blatant things written by their own hand. And yet these people are regarded as neutral, somehow neutral sort of fact finders when it comes to um, BBC coverage. The BBC, I mean, let's put, the BBC has an anti-Semitism problem, doesn't it? Yeah, this was glaring. It was brazen. There is no way that the BBC can defend this as anything other than outrageous bias directed at, once again at Israel, the, the nation's only Jewish country, in defence of yeah. Gaza. This is becoming a really, really quite concerning pattern of, of conduct from, the, from our yeah. national... I mean, and this is about these claims uh, about the Israeli soldiers beating and humiliating Palestinian medics during a hospital raid in Gaza last month. Bearing in mind, we've got another attack from the IDF on, on a major hospital in Gaza right now. It is very important that we get the facts on these things. And when Israel does wrong, we've had the uh, is, Israeli uh, Prime Minister's spokeswoman on the show the, uh, last week, we call out and say, you know, be, you know we, should, we should call it out and we should you know, talk about the need for humanitarian aid and the like. But if you've got the BBC, which is incredibly incredibly trusted around the world, giving completely biased reports based on people who are clearly unreliable, they're not neutral, then, then what's the point of the BBC at all? Yeah, and let's not forget, of course, you cannot watch television of any other programme unless yeah. you are prepared to pay yeah. for this. This is a state broadcaster that is forcing us to pay for it. If you don't pay it, you'll go up to the magistrate's court, 10% of all crimes prosecuted in the magistrate's court yeah. in this country are for not paying this television tax. I'm getting to the stage now where myself, in which I cannot morally justify paying yeah. to support something that is so flagrantly Absolutely. biased. I, I have to obey the law, but I have to say I've got very big question marks about it. I think the BBC are digging their own grave, which is sad for them, but, I mean, you know, it, it's not unless you're sad for the truth. Uh, there we are. Um, Sam Armstrong, thank you so much. More thoughts from you coming up. Uh, but I want to hear from you about Rishi Sunak. He's apparently urging Tory MPs to stick with him because the economy will bounce back for the next general election. Uh, he's been giving a speech alongside Kemi Badenoch, his business secretary, talking about uh, new rules uh, on, on for, for small businesses and more help on paying for apprentices and trying to get rid of some of that red tape. But you know, is that the sort of stuff that's going to make the difference in the next election? I want to know, should they keep Rishi Sunak or should they ditch him for another leader? And if so... Who should they ditch him for? Give us a call, 0344 499 You can text on 8722. Or you can get in touch on X at Talk TV. Sharon has done just that. She says, at this point, what difference does it make? Tommy says, the longer Sunak is PM, the more seats the Tories will lose. That seems to be the argument from some MPs. And Jackie says, ditch him. But I don't trust the MPs to choose the leader that the electorate would want. Ah but you don't say who that would be. Give us a call, let us know. Uh, you have been getting in touch on the phone, so let's go to Carol, who is in Cornwall. Hello, Carol. Oh, hello, Julia. Hello, how are you? Hello. I'm fine, thank you. You're probably doing better than Rishi Sunak today. So, should they <laughs> keep him or should they ditch him? It's stick or twist, Carol, what would you do? Well, as for Pen Penny Mordant, I don't know why, but I'm getting feedback on this line. Oh, well, um, we can hear you, so please persevere, if okay, you will. Okay, OK. OK, Penny Mordaunt, I can't believe that anyone would think that she's Prime Minister material. Where do they get that idea from? As I remember, David Frost said that she was often missing in action and wasn't up to her brief. In other words, she was lazy. I, I you, can't you, imagine... You said that, that on my breakfast show. <laughs> Yeah, yes, that's right. And, you know, there was some debate also about her, her uh, Navy career where um, things were said by her which turned out to be inaccurate. So I don't really think... I think we've had enough of inaccuracies and people lying and being, having no integrity. The, the Conservatives are finished. Sometimes you have to just accept the inevitable.
Now, I don't think anything good is going to happen for the British people. I think we just have to knuckle down and face another, after the next election, we're going to face another disaster, just with a, a different coat on. Yeah. And, and it is really quite despairing, but I don't see anyone in their right minds, even Penny Morden, taking over a job that you're going to lose within within months. Yeah, that, that's your one chance, although the idea, I think, has been that, well, she's got to see it that she might lose, in which case it might be her only chance. But again, no-one seriously thinks that will that will be the big game-changer. I've been tweeting over the weekend, you know, I like Penny as a person, but again, the fact that she said that twice, it's about trans men are men and yes. trans women are women, I know. Uh, she wrote <laughs> back on it, but... You just said it. It's out there. You, if you think it or you, you don't think it, but you've said it. Sorry, that's no, a deal breaker. She meant, for me. she meant what she meant. What she said. Yeah. She meant what she said when she said it. Yeah, exactly. And again, she she has fabulous hair. She's fantastic yeah, performer in the commons. She really is yeah. fantastic uh, at taking on, on all comers. Uh, and she held that sword magnificently at the coronation. But that's not enough, is it? It's just no, it's not, not enough. No, it's not enough. And the Conservatives now are known to be. Uh, you know, a party that does not live up to its manifesto promises. Look at the immigration. He's turned the boats back. Really? Does he believe that? You know, I mean, it's, it's as if I'm living in a parallel universe and I listen to what these people say and I think they must be mad. Or maybe it's me. I think, I think we all think that quite a lot. Not you, them. Uh, Carol, thank you so much. I'd like Carol to run. Uh, Carol's in Cornwall. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, coming up after the break, the Defence Secretary Grant Shapps has accused Vladimir Putin of being a modern-day Stalin. This after a sham election that he won with 87% of the vote because pretty much any opposition leader was either dead or imprisoned. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, a trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV. Now, Defence Secretary Grant Shapps has accused Vladimir Putin of being a modern day Stalin. This after a sham election in which the Russian president won a fifth term in office with a landslide, 87% of the vote. Joining me right now is former National Security Advisor and former UK Ambassador to the United States, Lord Kim Derrick. Good morning to you, Lord Derrick. Good morning, Julian. Thanks for joining us. Um, my first question is, generally, we, we, you know, the result of this election was never in doubt. It wasn't really an election. If you imprison everybody or kill everybody who wants to stand against you, it's not really a free and fair election. There are a few others who stood who were all Putin uh, acolytes and appointees. But here's the thing. If you are an autocratic dictator, why do you feel the need to go through the sham election? And if you do go through the sham election, why only give yourself 87%? Why not go the full Kim Jong-un, full 100%? <laughs> the second part is a good question, Julian. I don't know the answer, except that I suppose it stretches credibility even further if you get, uh, if you get 98, 99% or even 100%. On the first question, look, part of this is about how it looks abroad. And of course, we are all saying in the West, it was a sham election. As it was, what happened to Navalny shows what happens if you're a serious opponent of Vladimir Putin. But in the rest of the world, they may see things, see things a little differently. And what it means he can do is he can go on the international stage and say, first of all, I have complete support from the Russian population, or near complete support. Second, this was an endorsement of what I am doing in Ukraine. Because you all said that... Uh, but the mothers of Russian casualties and that, uh, that other opponents would, would present a real obstacle. And look, 87% 80 of the country support me. So in that sense, it's, it's, it's useful for international signaling, international presentation. And remember that he's part of this BRICS group with, with China and South Africa and Brazil. Um, and uh, so he, he's, he's developing his own international fora out there and uh, this, is, uh, this is a message you can send to the world. Indeed, and it is extraordinary the amount of money that the uh, Russian government is spending, 30 to 40% now of all government spending is being spent on that war effort. A lot of what he was saying in the press conference after uh, the election result came out last night was, um, was, was about the war effort, was about the sort of the threat from the West to Russian territory and the like. Um, he's very much gearing this up. There is, there is nothing in, in, that, in that election sham election, faux victory, that oh, anyone he's had to say since that suggests the Ukraine war is ending any time soon. Does it suggest to you at all that we should be wary of further threats to other nations? Um, look, first of all, that analysis is absolutely right. And um, uh, he will... I always thought anyway he would wait and see what happened in the US elections before... You know, taking any decision about what he's going to do in uh, in Ukraine, whether to go for a deal or continue the war. Um, the ground war is now going better for him anyway than it did last year. That's another reason for him to carry on. Although we shouldn't overstate Russian success because they've lost something like 15 ships from their Black Sea fleet. And Ukraine is now ramping up its exports and its economy is going much better. So it's not going all Russia's way. But they have still had some successes in the ground campaign, um, and they will think that they can score more successes over the next few months, especially if the West can't get its act together and get more ammunition and more weapons to, to Ukraine. Is Russia a threat more widely? Absolutely it is. Um, I mean, if you were to, to take more territory in Ukraine, and particularly if you were able to take Kyiv, then I think you would look at the Baltic states next, which he's always yeah. believed are a part of Russia's historic territory. And then there's Moldova further to, to the west, which already has part of its territory held by a pro-Russian breakaway government. So there's options for him across Central and Eastern Europe. Yeah. And certainly we saw at the weekend the uh, Latvian foreign minister, former prime minister of that country, uh, saying that you know, they've brought in conscription the same way that you know, Finland has had that for many years, where they have an extraordinary 250,000 strong reserve army. People, you know, they're trained up, they go back to civilian life, but they can be retrained because they are called up uh, at, at a moment's notice. Um, and Latvia doing the same. And suggestion that Western nations, including Britain, should be looking at doing that, like you know, with your, you know, national former national security advisor hat on. Is that something that would ever be considered? 
by the British government ahead of the possibility of war? Would that something that only happen in wartime? Because many people are saying, and including this Latvian foreign minister, is that, you know, the, the knowledge and ability that, that you have the ability to fight a war, you've got those, those, those men and women on the ground, that's what prevents wars. Having the weaponry, the ability to use it, having the, 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 the boots on the ground, that's what prevents wars. And, and it may be too little too late in the event of an actual invasion of one of our yeah. NATO allies. I agree about the too little too late risk, you know, but I would say we're a long, long way away from any ideas about conscription. I think the more important objective uh, at the moment is actually, as Grant Shapps has said, to go out defence spending way above 2% 2, 2 of GDP. We need to be up at 2.5% or approaching 3%, as he is pushing for. And the fact is, if you add all of you know, the United States and Europe together, we have a way bigger economy than, uh, than, than Russia has. If we got our act together collectively in NATO, uh, we produced more of our own uh, ammunition and weaponry, uh, and we spent more on defence, we would massively out, uh, out, outpower um, uh, Russia. So actually, I think that's the real priority at the moment, mm. rather than talking about, about conscription. Okay. Well, let's talk about um, Donald Trump. He's constantly in the news anyway, but he, he has said repeatedly, you know, if he uh, won the, the, uh, Europe, the, the US election in November, and he was in power from January next year, he would end the Ukraine war in, in one day. He's never really spelt out exactly how he'd do that, but with obviously with Republicans basically being told by Donald Trump to stop this uh, multi-billion pound payment uh, of, to, to, to buy arms for, for, heading to Ukraine um, in Congress, one would suspect it would be that the funds would be cut off, military aid cut off, and basically Ukraine mm -hmm. would be either losing or forced to rely on Europeans who don't have currently the ability to produce that sort of weaponry. Um, do you think that do you think that Vladimir Putin is, as many suspected last time around in 2016, hoping for a Trump victory? And what do you think a Trump victory would mean for Ukraine and for Russia? Uh, you said earlier, Judah, correctly, there are things that Donald Trump says that we shouldn't worry about and things that he says that we should worry about. And what he said on Ukraine is one of the latter, it's one of the things we should worry about. The only way you could do a deal um, instantly on coming into office would be to, as he said he would, to say to Zelensky, not uh, another uh, bullet or or Shell is coming your way, um, that's all over, go and do a deal with Putin, and then to encourage Putin to, to do a deal with Zelensky. And the only deal that is conceivable that Putin would do would, one, would be one that leaves him with at least all the territory he has captured now, some 15% of Ukrainian territory, but possibly he would demand more, because he would, he would believe he was in a strong position to take more territory. So the whole of the Donbass so, region? Yeah, yeah, take all of the Donbass, and maybe a bit more. So if, if we were going down that track, what that means in effect is a very substantial defeat for the West. We spent almost 200 billion supporting and arming Ukraine over the last two years. Um, and that money would effectively have been wasted. And Putin would have got a success. He would have achieved at least some of his objectives. The rest of the world would notice this, particularly China in relation to Taiwan, and think, Yet again, the West can't stay the course, and it would be, therefore, I think, a, a defeat of a strategic nature. So this we really, really should be worried about, um, uh, and uh, I think it would be a, a, a really bad moment for the West. Really interested to get your thoughts on all of that. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, it's former National Security Advisor, former UK Ambassador to the US as well, Lord Darroch. Um, Sam Armstrong still with me. Um, these are serious concerns. There are a lot of very serious people who know, who know their stuff in the military diplomatic world who are very, very concerned about Vladimir Putin and what his aims are, but also concerned about the implications, particularly of a Trump presidency, given what's happening with Congress and that, those funds for Ukraine. Um, what do you make of it all? Well, the worrying thing is if, as Lord Derek says, Vladimir Putin gets something of a win out of this war. In his Anything world. that he can claim. Is Obviously a not what he was after, which was to take over the, the, the whole country. His track record shows that this is a dictator that never stops there. He invaded Georgia, North Ossetia, got away with that. Uh, he invaded Crimea, got away with that. If he invades Ukraine, gets away with that, 
where we'll be next. Realistically, I mean, would, would it be a NATO country? I mean, the Latvia and other countries, they are, you know, they're surrounded effectively by, you know, Russian territory. Um, that, you know, they are very, very wary. They are members of NATO. I, my thing is, I just don't necessarily trust that NATO members will step up for those nation states. Yeah, and what you've got to realise is that Vladimir Putin built his career as part of the USSR where they had it all. And if there's one mission he's got in life, it's to get that it Soviet empire so, back. doesn't it? Uh, well, let's talk about whether Rishi Sunak can keep his empire <laughs> still going. We're asking you today about Rishi Sunak urging Tory MPs to stick with him because the economy will bounce back for the general election. He's been speaking this morning at a business uh, event, basically getting rid of some red tape and trying to actually uh, uh, encourage more firms to take on apprentices. But is that the sort of stuff that's going to ignite the nation's fire, fire for him? Uh, should they keep Sunak or should they ditch him for another leader? It's a, it's a twist or stick. Uh, give us a call on 03 double four four double nine one thousand text eight seven treble two or get in touch on exit talk tv stephen says ditch all conservatives they've had their day don says the tories will get a bashing but maybe less of one if they change leader but it has to go to the tory members to vote on it oh, well it doesn't necessarily it didn't last time after soon for sunak and paul says that they've treated the people who voted for them with utter contempt some of you have also been getting in touch on the phones. Do please keep those calls coming in. Brendan is in Hartlepool. Hello, Brendan. Good morning, Julia. How are you? Very well indeed. All the better for speaking to you. Very chirpy on this uh, this uh, sunny Monday morning. Um, what it's do you think gorgeous. they should do? It's gorgeous in Hartlepool. Red oh. wall seat, which is unfortunately probably going to go back blue. Uh, go back to Labour, unfortunately. Yeah. I think they should... Uh, I don't think I don't think soon I should have got the job in the first place. Right. Um, I wanted Penny Morgan to get to get the gig way back when it was first mooted after Boris left, and they didn't elect her. She's brilliant. Why? She's very good in Why? the House of Commons. Yeah. She's a good talker. She's she she talks a lot of sense. She's probably more of a Tory than unfortunately uh, Rushi is um, because um, he doesn't he hasn't done any Tory policies. You know, if if it was Tory, we would have left by Brexit by now, wouldn't we? But no, he hasn't done that. No, no hold on a minute. But again, I find that I'm fascinated by this about Penny. Again, I think Penny Morden's a great performer. Is that enough anymore? I mean, I just, I want people who are going to get stuff done. And, and you think, of it, is it really a conservative policy to say that trans men are men and trans women are women? Uh, That's probably about not, as unconservative no, she... as you can be, isn't it? Well, you know, uh, at least she can say what, what, what's a man, isn't she? Not like Mr. I Mr. don't. Starmer. I don't. No, but yeah, mm, I, I genuinely, I don't, I don't get it. My thing with Penny Morton, and again, with a lot of these people, what is your track record? What have you done? What have you done? You know, she was a Navy reservist, and then she's had, yeah. you know, Defence Secretary for five minutes, leader of the Commons, done some good little quips in the Commons. I don't know what else she's done other than holding a sword. Well, you're right, you're right, but um, she, I, I just get, when I've listened to her in the past and, and seen her at the dispatch box she's doing, great. Ripping, ripping rain into bits and all that, it was, it, it, yeah. it, it impressed me. No, abs no I'm 100% with does. you. She's a fantastic performer, but do we not need, does not our great country need a bit more than someone who can perform? I mean, it should be nice, well, someone who can perform, we're, we're, but... Do we need some substance? Unfortunately, we're, we're in the media world where it's, it's, all, it's all on performance anyway, isn't it? If she, had, if she comes across competent and, and authoritarian and, and, and knows what she's doing, okay. she will get votes that way. Well, we, sh we shall see. We shall see whether it's going to happen I, before, or not. Before I go, can yeah, I just very ask quick. one more thing? Yeah. Um, Putin's not going to invade a NATO country. That is nuclear devastation. He might, want, he might want to take Ukraine and rebuild the USSR, but he's not going to do it against the NATO You think he's not country. stupid enough? He is not an idiot. It's he, we would all die, but he would die because he'd be a target. Do you know what? So he's I, not going to go any further. I don't think NATO would use our nuclear weapons. So I don't. Th I don't think he thinks. I don't think. I don't think either side will. Frankly, I think it'll be a lunatic who uses uh, nuclear okay, weapons. Okay, there you go. I'll let you go. No, 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 thank you, but I really appreciate your call. Get return to the joys of sunny Hartlepool. Thank you for that. Ah, Coming up Thanks after the break, twenty thousand new apprenticeships are set to be created under the PM's new plans to cut red tape for businesses. That's what he's been talking about this morning. We'll have a little watch and listen of that. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl.
JK Rowling says, let's just be honest. It's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that oh, a, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and you are with Talk TV. Now, 20,000 new apprenticeships are set to be created under new plans to fund training for young people and cut red tape for small businesses. Joining me now to discuss this is Vicky Price. She's Chief Economic Advisor at the Centre for Economic and Business Research. She's also a former government advisor. Good morning to you, Vicky. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Well, let's have a little watch and a listen of a clip of uh, Rishi Sunak this morning at this event uh, with his business secretary, Kemi Bajanok, uh, talking about apprenticeships. Uh, let's see what he had to say. Apprenticeships benefit young people and the businesses who hire them. But for SMEs, the system can be expensive and confusing, despite the huge progress. So to ensure that funding is available whenever there is demand for apprenticeships, we're increasing the apprenticeship budget by £40 million and for small businesses hiring young apprentices, we will now fund the cost of their training in full. We're not there yet, but we are absolutely moving in the right direction. So let's stick to the plan and build a better, brighter future together. The plan is definitely uh, one of those quotes we're going to be uh, hearing a lot of the next year. Um, this is extraordinary. The full cost of apprenticeships for people aged on 21 or under for small firms will be paid in full by, well, the government taxpayers, you and me, from the 1st of April. That's at £60 million, pounds, creating 20,000 more apprenticeships. I mean, look, this is great news, I would have thought, for apprenticeships, apprentices, young people hoping to get onto the ladder, and for small firms trying to, uh, to you know, see if they can afford uh, these, uh, these young people and train them up. But is it enough, Vicky? It's a very good question. Actually, the amount of money isn't huge, but I think what it does is it incentivizes perhaps, uh, you know, more firms to look at how they can train their people because it takes away some of the burdens that are there. They're more important because until now, small firms had to, you know, put a certain amount of money uh, for that training themselves. So they did get quite a lot through the apprenticeship levy, which is paid for by the big firms, which put a certain percentage 
of their uh, overall um, bills for payroll uh, into that 0.5%. The government tops it up by another, an extra 10% themselves of the overall amount. A lot of that is used then again by the big firms, but also it gets transferred if it's not used to the small firms. That's the whole point of, uh, of the exercise. Now, small firms would have had to go and ask the government for, for, for funding for this. And then, of course, they would have to also uh, put some money out of their own pockets. Now, what's going to happen is that the government will pay the lot, um, which is good news. It means less bureaucracy. So, yeah, it might incentivize more small firms to use some yeah. of that money that they will be getting uh, for training their people and it will improve yeah. the skill levels. And, and I think for the bigger firms as well now, it seems that this change is also going to allow them to transfer something like 50% of their unused funds, the ones that haven't used themselves, to smaller firms, to other firms, which will also increase the overall amount that's available yeah. I mean, for them. So the good thing, news overall. Well, we talk a lot about, like, oh, we don't have young people to do these jobs in this country. Well, we need to train people up, but there's been a real disincentive on that. A lot of companies think, well, we can't afford it. And, and let's be honest, for a lot of young people arriving in the, in the workplace, you know, with all due respect, they're a lot of they're a big workload for their colleagues, and they and they're not much use quite early on. And so it, it is actually a, a big burden for for businesses. There's also this talk about you know cutting red tape and also raising the VAT threshold up to ninety thousand, a point at which basically any firm once you're taking in more than eighty five thousand previously, you know you you had to start charging VAT of. 20% on everything you did, basically putting your prices up for all the customers you've already got. And we can see the huge bunching of small businesses under that 85%, now well, 85,000 pounds, sorry, now it's going to be 90,000 pounds threshold, where companies just go, it's not worth my while. Unless I could sort of treble my income, I'm going to lose so much business by putting my prices up by 20% that it's not worth my while. Isn't any threshold there, isn't any threshold going to be a problem in terms of preventing small businesses from growing? It's always an issue. And in fact, there was a big lobby saying perhaps we should reduce the threshold because most businesses or single uh, self-employed people perhaps earn you know, enough to, to be within that threshold, but they perhaps earn, let's say, on average, more than 20,000, 30,000, 40,000. Why don't we redu reduce the threshold to that so it doesn't inhibit them from expanding them further? So, because obviously, if you said it quite, uh, you know, at, at any level, so, there would so basically be this, for this any, problem. anything that's more than a one-man yeah. band, then you're, you're basically yeah. going to have to have VAT. Yeah. And, you know, absolutely. If you do that, then of course it, it, you take the disincentive out completely. But of course, uh, you know, you have the overall disincentive, which is, is it worth even starting it? Yeah. And, and, and that's, also that's prices go up for everybody at a time when people are still dealing with the cost of living. What about these, this red tape issue? Because I, I, yeah. I genuinely, I think I've lost count of the number of times that a <laughs> government minister said, we're going to cut red tape. They never seem to do it, though. Well, they try. Uh, and I think it is going to become easier, I think, for smaller firms. There is one interesting change that will happen as a result of the, the talk today and what's been announced by the government already, because you can see it on the government website, which is that the definition of what is a small firm is going up. So instead of requiring you to be a small firm only if you have less than 250 employees, you're now a small firm and therefore eligible to have these funds transferred to you uh, if you have 500 employees. So we've changed the definition. Uh, so it means that many, many more firms will be in this game, which is okay. good news from that point of view. Thank you so much, Vicky Price. Appreciate that. Well, let's come to Sam Armstrong. I mean, look, you know, anything that makes small businesses more able to employ people, train people, carry on expanding their business is a good thing. But you just sort of feel like the the weight on small businesses is so great in terms of the admin. Yeah, and this, you know, uh, no doubt, good move, good steps, but it does feel a bit small fry, doesn't it? And it doesn't everything that the government does feel like that, though? It does right now, uh, but this is not <laughs> the sort of actions, this is what I keep saying, of a Prime Minister that's genuinely trying to do everything possible. We need something a bit more gung-ho, a bit more you know, big statements, big messages, not like not like sort of messing around at the edges. That's the key thing, isn't it? There's people feel they want, they want to have a big, a big message message about letting the economy grow? I don't think the average red wall voter is honestly thinking that much about the regulatory form filling out that medium-sized yeah. businesses are having to do. Yeah, I think I think you may be right about that. It may be, yeah, again, all these announcements, too little, too late. Thank you very much. More from Sam Armstrong coming up in the next hour. Uh, also, more on the online speculation about Kate Middleton. Also, net zero targets could be under threat as heat pumps aren't as popular as the government had hoped. Oh, what a terrible shame that is. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer and you're with Talk TV.
A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, there was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome back to the show. I'm Julia hartley Brew. You're with Talk TV. We're on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. And I'm with you live from 10 until 1. Coming up in this hour, more on Rishi Sunak urging Tory MPs to stick with him, telling backbenchers that the economy is turning a corner. This comes amid rumours that Commons leader Penny Mordaunt is leading a plot to oust the Prime Minister before the next election. Is that what you'd want to happen? And Defence Secretary Grant Shapps has accused Vladimir Putin of being a modern-day Stalin after a sham election in which the Russian president won a fifth term in office with a landslide, 87% of the vote. How did he manage it? Oh, we know. He killed or imprisoned all of his opposition leaders. And a government watchdog has warned that the public's enthusiasm for heat pumps has been somewhat overestimated, with uptake less than half the expected number. I'm amazed it's that high. That's despite taxpayer subsidies from you and me to help the UK hit net zero targets. We'll talk about all of that with Ralph Schollhammer. First, though, let's get the latest news headline with Elliot Gopkin. Good afternoon. Business Secretary Kemi Badenoch has dismissed suggestions that a large number of Tory MPs on the right of the party have been holding secret talks in a plot to replace Rishi Sunak. Sources say they're looking to crown Penny Mordaunt as their new leader if the Prime Minister faces a confidence vote in the coming weeks. However, the Business Secretary told the BBC only a small minority felt like that. Talk TV's political correspondent Alicia Fitzgerald says some need to take the job of Prime Minister more seriously. 
Well, I think this question of whether someone would accept it just because it's kind of their only chance to be the Prime Minister, I mean, that just opens a wider debate of whether or not this is just personal politics. Yeah. I mean, if you're the Prime Minister, uh, if you're in any political party, you're meant to be working for people, you're meant to be working for the public. It's not specifically meant just to all about your personal gain or what you can put on your CV. And I think if that does happen, lots of people will see through that and be quite annoyed that that has happened. I mean, you're meant to be doing what's best for the country, not what's best for you. Vladimir Putin has claimed a landslide win in Russia's election, extending his rule as president for another six years. Early results last night claimed the leader, who has ruled for nearly a quarter of a century, won nearly 88% of the vote. However, no credible opposition candidate was allowed to stand. Putin hailed his win as an indication of trust and hope in him. Professor Scott Lucas, international politics professor at University College Dublin, told Talk TV the election was a sham. Look, you know, these these were stage managed elections. Uh, the Kremlin is in control, control of almost all Russian state media. Any legitimate challenger, especially one who criticized the Kremlin's policies or the invasion of Ukraine, was barred from standing. Uh, this was simply a formality, not only to proclaim Putin a victor with 87.5%, but a turnout of more than 70%. Media regulator Ofcom has found GB News broke broadcasting rules in five programmes hosted by serving Tory MPs. They involve episodes from Sir Jacob Rees-Mogg's show and a programme fronted by Esther McVeigh and Philip Davies. Under Ofcom rules, politicians aren't normally allowed to host news programmes, but they are allowed to present current affairs shows. The Met Police has arrested a man after two people were injured by crossbow bolts in Shoreditch. Officers say a 47-year-old man has been detained on suspicion of attempted murder following a series of crossbow attacks. The victims, who suffered minor injuries, have now all left hospital. Britain's most successful female Olympian, Dame Laura Kenny, has announced her retirement from cycling. The 31-year-old won five Olympic golds and seven world championships. She gave birth to her second son last July and will now not compete at this year's Paris Olympics. And street artist Banksy has confirmed he is behind a new artwork that appeared overnight in Finsbury Park in North London. The work, which shows a mass of green painted, uh, green painted behind a cut black tree to look uh, like foliage, has a stencil of a person holding a pressure hose next to it. The artist revealed he was responsible on Instagram. That's the latest. Now time for a look at today's weather with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, it's a sunny afternoon for the vast majority of the UK and largely dry and mild as well. But there are some showers spreading eastwards, mainly across eastern parts of the UK for this afternoon. And before the end of the day, wet and windy weather will be heading towards parts of Northern Ireland and western parts of Britain. But in between all of that, for most of Scotland, England and Wales, it's sunny, it's mainly dry, bar the showers in the east, and it's feeling warm. Warm for the time of year with temperature highs are locally up to 17 to 18 degrees Celsius, the average for this time of the year is around 11. Now, overnight, we'll continue to see that rain across uh, Northern Ireland spread towards parts of Scotland, Northern and Western England and Wales. It will be windy with it as well and there'll be more wet weather heading across Northern Ireland through the night as well. But it looks like for eastern and southeastern parts of England, it will just about stay dry and everywhere will have a mild night with temperatures holding up in double figures. So tomorrow, once again, it will stay mild, but it's going to be a bit of a wetter day, especially across England and Wales. We'll see spells of rain turning into showers spreading southeast but skies will brighten across many areas. So in the sunshine and the southerly winds, it's still going to be another mild day. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good afternoon. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia hartley -Britt. You are with Talk TV, still with me, look, talking about all the big stories of the day. It's commentator Sam Armstrong. Uh, afternoon to you once again. Uh, look, we're talking a lot about Rishi Sunak today. Um, once again, leadership woes. I mean, I'm wondering, is this what we're going to do every Monday from now on until the election, as and when? Not May the 2nd, we know that. Some people are saying, well, it could be in June or July. It is not going to be in June or July. There isn't even a manifesto ready to go. Uh, uh, we are reliably informed by people who know. Uh, but the Prime Minister has urged Tory MPs to stick with him 
because the economy will bounce back. We're looking at inflation falling down to 2%. By the way, that still mean prices going up, just by not as much as they have been going up uh, before the next general election. Um, I want to know from our audience today, should they keep Sunak or should they ditch him for another leader? You can give us a call on 0344 499 1000, text on 8722 or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Calls are charged at the national rate. Text costs one standard network rate message. Um, so, so, Sam, I mean, what do, here's the thing. First, what does ditching Rishi Sunak achieve? Well, right now, the Conservative Party are literally at their floor in terms of public support. 18, 20%. They've certainly never even been anywhere near like that level of public support. It could be, and there are some historical uh, analogies. Uh, Jacinda Ardern was swapped in very, very late for the Labour Party in New Zealand. Uh, Look how that worked out for them. <laughs> well, it wasn't good for the country, perhaps, you might well think, but it was very good for the Labour Party. They got a yeah. huge boost. She was elected, obviously went on to serve many terms. So it could be that a new, lively character could... Who hasn't could, failed us yet. Who hasn't failed us yet, hasn't broken manifesto commitments left, right and centre might, the argument goes, be able to get it up a little bit higher. And a little bit higher is a big difference if you're a Tory MP that is looking, on the one hand, being returned to Parliament, on the other hand, being on the breadline, perhaps. Looking down the barrel of the garden, not being able to pay the mortgage. Fascinating. More from Sam. Love to get to your thoughts on what our next guest has to say. Joining us right now is former Labour MP and now crossbench peer, Baroness Kate Howey. Good afternoon. I can just call you Kate, can't I? Of course you can. Thank you very Thank you. much Good indeed. I've never got... a very that. sunny Belfast. <laughs> I, well, everywhere's sunny today. We've seen London, yeah, Harleypool. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Doesn't it make you feel different? It almost makes you feel positive about the country and the government. OK, I, maybe I, went, I took it too far that time. Um, let's just go back to what Rishi Sunak has said. He says, look, you know, stick with me. You know, things are looking up. The economy's turning... We're going to get some planes, you know, going to Rwanda, possibly. We, that bill could be, you know, by the end of the week could even be law and things. You know, things, things are going to look up. Do you think he's right? Uh, no, I think even if the economy does improve a little, and, you know, it hasn't been, it has got better, there's no doubt about it, sir. But the reality is I think the public generally has lost trust in, in the Conservatives. And trust is one of those words that might be a little bit old-fashioned these days, but... I don't think people believe really anything much that uh, the Conservatives are saying at the moment. And I mean, I could also say I don't think they're believing very much about what the uh, Labour Party is saying either. So I think there's a general mood in the country of disillusionment, complete fed upness with a government that's been in power for 14 years, that's gone back on so many of its promises, particularly what happened in the 2019 election. You know, when you think about it, Julia, a majority of 80, where has it gone? Why has it gone? And it's gone because they didn't do what they said they would do. And even, it's very simple. Even so allowing I, for, I don't... Co even allowing for COVID and a lockdown, and look, you know, that you know, lots of things weren't done because there were, other, there were other things going on, we understand. We've got Ukraine war yeah. as well. There still comes a point when voters say, well, hold on a minute. We, 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 you, you said you were going to do stuff. We told you, yes, we'll have that, thank you. And then... You haven't delivered. Um, do you think a change of leader for the Conservatives would make any difference? A lot of talk about Penny Morden, whether she's a stalking horse or actually wants it herself. Mm. She has been conspicuously silent, even though it's thought that the rumours didn't really start with her camp. Then we've got Kemi Badenoch, Suella Bravman, Robert Jenricks on, on the right, Tom Tugendhat on the left. Some of these figures, very popular among their, their fellow MPs, some very popular among Tory members, some very popular among the public. But are any of them popular enough to... A, win, B, unite the party, and C, win a general election. I don't think any change of leader at this stage in the electoral cycle will make the slightest bit of difference. Uh, I mean, I think that uh, there would never be a real unity around one particular candidate. It's far too late. And I think what is going to have to happen, I think there are many Conservatives who deep down know this, that they're going to have to be pretty well smashed at the next election. And then the Conservatives can actually have a debate about what kind of party they want to be. Are they a genuine Conservative party? Or have they moved so far now towards being a kind of wishy-washy, middle of the road, basically almost the same as Labour? I mean, reality is there's very little difference between the two parties. And that's why, you know, there's a lot of unknowns coming up in this, in this next election. Uh, we haven't heard yet whether uh, George Galloway is going to put up 
candidates in certain Labour held seats where the Muslim vote might be very high. We, we've seen the increasing support for reform. And of course, reforms come in with not really being very well known as a, as a named party. And I was down in Wellingburg because I was supporting very strongly Ben Habib there, who I think is an excellent, would have been an excellent member of parliament. And it was very interesting because at the beginning of the campaign, that reform, you know, weren't really doing that. People didn't know them. There wasn't name yeah. recognition. Ben wasn't known. And then as time went on, what they were saying was really beginning to resonate with the apathetic people, the people who didn't really could be bothered voting even for Conservatives or Labour. Uh, and by the end of it, uh, you know, the postal votes sadly come very early. So they tend to vote for people who kind of know what they're doing. Mm. By the end of the campaign, um, you know, the, the reform vote was really going up. So I think I think people shouldn't underestimate the, the, the importance that reform will have yep. across the country. And, and, and a, ma a major threat to the Conservatives in some key seats, but also, especially those Red Bull seats, but also a threat to Labour in terms of taking a tranche of votes from both sides, more from Tories and others. Um, you, you, obviously, you were you're a Labour MP for many years and, and the Labour Minister. Um, how strong do you think Labour's lead really is in the polls? Because poll after poll has shown that, you know, Labour's way ahead, you know, no matter what, you know, easy. It's an easy majority right now. You know, other things being equal, if nothing changes. Um, again, you know, never say never in, in British politics anymore. But it does appear that when you look at the, the don't knows, the won't bother to vote, it does appear there's an awful lot of apathy towards Labour. So it's more of a vote that is against the Tories rather than, oh, I think Keir Starmer's going to be this amazing leader. I mm. really think Labour are going to change things. It doesn't feel like 1997 and that appetite there was for Blair. Absolutely not. I mean, I remember 1997. There was a kind of euphoria in the country, and I remember campaigning in what was well, seen as a fairly safe Among Labour seat. voters, Kate, everyone among always thinks voters. that half the country didn't vote for it. Well, no, I, know, I know that, but, you know, what I don't think we're seeing amongst Labour Party activists even is that, is that you know, absolutely burning, burning um, desire uh, uh, to win the way they saw Tony Blair as being a real change. Uh, and I think that there's an awful lot of people out there come the day, uh, you know, will actually look and think, do I really want to, 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 to risk this or shall I just not bother voting? And I think that is the real uh, concern yeah. that there'll be an awful lot of people who just do not vote. And I've always said that, that you know, the idea of a huge, huge Labour majority is not going to happen. I would have thought we're, you know, looking in, they would be very happy and satisfied if they got something like, majority of 40 or 50. Yeah. But the idea that, you know, that, that, that there will, because I think there will be a lot of unknowns and people coming in who are not necessarily Conservative or Labour this time. And I, that might be a really important shift this time, that we're not yeah. just seeing things as a, as a two-party system. You know, within, so I mean, the Lib Dems, I don't think are going to do very well. That's the thing. And what's fascinating is, is it's fascinating reading the commentary from, you know, the, the, the great experts who told us in 2010, well, it was the end of the big two-party system. It was going to be coalitions all the way. Then 2015, we had the Tory majority, you know, and then it was like the you know, destruction of the Lib Dems. Well, you know, they've come back again a bit. And then it was, you know, everything was going to be changing. And Tories, well, the Tories were going to be in for years after 2019. Labour were out for, for you know, for a decade or yeah. more. Again, I, I just don't think you cannot predict anything. The only thing is that, that does affect our politics more than it does, say, elections across Europe is this first-past-the-post system, which I'm a big fan of. Yeah. I do support that. I don't want coalitions that take months to decide who's the prime minister, as we see in, in, in Germany, in the Netherlands and elsewhere. But it does make it much harder for smaller parties to have their say and to get ahead. So you can get, you know, 25% in the polls and end up with one MP. Yes, and, and, I, and I've always been very torn on that because I do think it's unfair when you look at, you know, for example, the vote that, um, that you, uh, you got and got no, no MPs and so on. But at the same time, having been a con constituency member of parliament for 30 years, I really value the idea that you're elected by your constituency and you represent everybody. I can't be bothered with this idea that if you retire or you move away, the party puts somebody else in for you because then they're not directly elected. It's a bit like... You know, Rishi, in a sense, hasn't been directly elected, has he, by by the public? Um, you know, the prime minister, he's not he's not been. Um, you know, the party didn't win under him. So I, I think I, I would. I, I know there's a lot of people push for uh, 
electoral reform, but I just don't like the idea. I mean, look at look at Holland, for example. They still haven't got a, a government after months of, yeah. because of the way the system works. So we have a lot of problems with our our democracy. But ultimately, you know, the public can decide. The public can make a 180 majority for one party go into a 160 majority for another if they yeah. choose. And that's where I think this election, I hope this general election, people will really think about what they're doing and think about the direction of the country and think about the parties that are actually care about the United Kingdom as a whole and are not just pushing their own sort of personal that's agendas. Interesting. And, and I, know, I know you'll agree with me on this. You touched on it a bit earlier. The important thing is to vote, and we've just seen the sham election in, in Russia, people are still, you know, dying and fighting for the chance to have yeah. a vote in many, many countries in Russia. You know, in, imagine a scenario where, you know, Keir Starmer was, you know, put in the gulag, um, you know, uh, for, for being the leader of yeah, the opposition. No, absolutely. I mean, do you know what I mean? It, it is mind-blowing that people are so casual about the right to vote. When people died in this country for our right to do that, whatever you do, whoever you vote for, go and vote. I would, I would actually make it compulsory like in Australia. But, but if you don't want to vote for anyone, you go and you spoil your, part, yep. your paper, but at least you have gone into the ballot, paper, ballot box. 100% agree with you on that, Kate. Thank you very much, Baroness at Hoey there. Still with me, Sam Armstrong. You're a bit of a libertarian. You wouldn't want compulsory voting, would you? Uh, I think if you don't want to participate, that's fine. But, but you, I think, you see, if you've got the benefits of living in a democracy, I think you should, you should have some responsibilities. And one of those is you have to vote. More for them. I do set the rule <laughs> that if you if you don't vote, you don't get to winch for the next. Oh, absolutely, long. always. That's absolutely rule. Um, I mean, God, that's for reasons I vote now. <laughs> get to have a moan about it. What did you make of what Kate Hoey had to say there? Well, look, I think it's very interesting that she is recognising, as a former long-standing Labour MP, that the also a Leave campaign. Also a Leave campaigner, but that. Keir Starmer's poll ratings are not the results of any great talent or merit on his side. Yeah. They're not the basis, they're not uh, based on a, a particularly inspiring platform or manifesto. He is about to be made Prime Minister on the back of how badly the Tories yeah. have done. That, that is often the case with, with elections, though, isn't it? But the key thing for me is it's actually, you know, careful what you wish for. Is this actually an election? And some commentators point this out the weekend, you know, is this, is, is this election you want to win? Because, the, you know, You've got exactly the same problem. None of those problems that the Tory government is facing and failing to deal with at the moment, none of them disappear the day after the election results. But very unusually, Keir Starmer is getting to come right up until election day without setting out what a Labour government is going to look like, what yeah. policies he's going to pursue. We have never known as little yeah. about the party that's about to, all chances are, take over this yeah. country. And if you don't make promises, you can't break them. There is that, isn't there? There will be very few promises being made, certainly. Well, I'm asking you today what do you think after Rishi Sunak has urged Tory MPs to stick with him because he says the economy is going to bounce back before the general election. It's going to be OK on the night. Should they keep Sunak or should they ditch him for another leader? Tell us who you think might do a better job. Give us a call 0344 499 1000. Text on 8722 or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Parker has got in touch to say nothing and nobody can save the Tories from their inevitable fate at the next election. Sean says Tory infighting loses votes. Keep him. Yeah, but does that stop the infighting? And uh, Robin says the Tories are toast at the next election, whoever is in charge. Uh, some of you have also been getting in touch on the phones. Do please keep those calls coming in. Let's go to Ken, who is in Lincoln. Hello, Ken. Hello, Julia. Thank you for taking my call. Well, thank I just want to check, first of all, is it sunny, Lincoln? Is it sunny there as well as everywhere else? It's, yeah, it's, uh, it's lovely. I've just come in from cutting the lawn. I've had you on my earphones. Oh, lovely. Been up and down the lawn, so. Yapping, yapping <laughs> in your ear. <laughs> it's like being my husband. Yeah, Imagine that I mean, joy. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a Conservative Party member, and, um, I mean, we're in a mess, Julia. We really are. And it's a mess of our own making. We, we can't blame anybody else. We've, we've fought amongst ourselves. We've got rid of leaders. We've... We've done some, some, some really poor things. My opinion is, as a, as, a, as a party member, we should just go with it now and let the public decide, let the public... You mean go for an election? It, well, yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I would say as soon as possible, but that's not going to happen. But when I say go for it, I mean go with, uh, go with Richie. All right. He's a leader. Let's go and see what happens. And we'll take our beating on the day, because it is going to be a beating. You, you, do, you don't see any prospect of a win? No, I don't really. It, there's, there's too many negative things. I mean, the press, the press, we have a bad press. We've, we've caused it ourselves, we've hurt ourselves, we've fought amongst ourselves, 
and nobody likes that in life. You, you can't you can't win anything. Here's, it, no, but here's the thing: together. there's so much obsession within the Conservative Party about we mustn't have infighting, you know, divided parties, lose elections. But th th is this some idea that if we all unite? Full stop, that's good enough. But isn't it about what you unite around? Because it seems to me what a lot of voters, who, certainly people who get in touch with this show and see, you know, it, online and, you know, letters, pages and newspapers, they, they just feel like they, they voted for a Conservative government in 2019 and they've got Labour light. That's what they're bothered about. So uniting yeah. around, you know, lay, more Labour light policies doesn't solve the problem. I just, I just think it's too late to unite now. I mean, so I mean, I, I, I mean, as a party member, I don't know how many factions there are within the no. party. I know <laughs> I there's at least five or six. Uh, so, so I don't know which what party I belong to. Uh, so, so my 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 resolution to this would be: go with what we've got, yep. take the beating on the day, and then let's see who we've got start left. Again. Because a lot of the people that yes, exactly, Julius, start again. Because we don't know. A lot of the people are talking about as perspective leaders, they might not be there. Well, that's they the issue. If you had your choice, look, if, if, look, there's no question at all, if Rishi Snack is Prime Minister going into an election and loses, he, he will resign. That's always what happens. What, what, who would you want uh, as the next leader? Oh, crikey, what a, what, what, what a decision. Um, I want somebody who is, um, believes in what they say. Now, if I had to write a list down now, I'd have Ben Patel, Ballynock and Jenrick. One of those four. Okay. Uh, for, the, for one reason, Julia, is that they all believe in what they're saying. The rest seem to believe in what they have to believe on the day to get through that day. Okay. These four are the, are the one. And if I had to choose from that, oh, it would be very close between uh, Ballynock and Brotherman for me. Ballynock and who else? Go. Uh, Brotherman. Uh, sorry. Oh. Ballinock so, so, and Bravman. Bra Bravman. Oh, OK. Interesting. All right. Thank you. Really interesting. Thank you very much. Great to get your call, Ken, in sunny Lincoln. Uh, coming up after the break, a government watchdog has warned that the public's enthusiasm for heat pumps has been somewhat overestimated, with uptake less than half the expected number. I'm amazed it's even that high. We're going to talk about all that up next with Ralph Schulhammer. I'm Julia hartley Brew, and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. 
The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're yeah, supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia hartley Brew, and you are with Talk TV. Now, our government watchdog, National Audit Office, has warned that the public's enthusiasm for heat pumps has been overestimated, with uptake less than half the expected number. That's despite you and I funding massive subsidies to help the UK, apparently, hit our completely pointless and ridiculous and absurd net zero targets. Well, joining me now to discuss this is Ralph Schollhammer. He's a political theorist and professor at Webster University in Vienna and wonderfully is in uh, town. I was watching one Peter Carboyle show yesterday. I went, right, Ralph's in town. Drag him into the studio on Monday as well. Lovely to see you. Lovely for having me. Um, Sam Armstrong's still with us, of course. I, I, I feel just as warmly as oh. I do about you. So I wouldn't <laughs> feel warm if I had a heat pump in my home because they don't work as well as my lovely, wonderful, I love it more than life itself, central heating. Which is probably why the British public have been really sensible. And they've apparently gone cold on heat pumps. Yeah, I mean, I think we see the same, by the way, with electric vehicles as well. There is a tendency that many of these programs and these ideas that have been pushed by the government, once subsidies become less or break away, the interest of the people does the same. Yeah. The big irony of the story, of course, is what people tend to forget is a good heat pump can work as an air conditioning unit in the summer. So the idea that heat pumps will save electricity is probably going to be the exact opposite. Because aircon uses even more oh, yeah. uh, uh, electricity, doesn't it? And but if it's really getting as warm as we have been told, an Austrian newspaper said this will be the summer from hell because it's going to be so hot. Um, so people, of course, will use their heat pumps as cooling units even more than they do now. Exactly. Now, the thing about the heat pumps is they cost a lot more than, than boilers. They use up a lot more space in your home and you often have to you know, dig a hole in the garden to put them in. So there are lots of things where... You kind of, you kind of have to you, you use a lot more resources. It involves basically. I mean, given that most homes in Britain have got central heating, a wonderful, wonderful thing that mass improved people's lives in the late twentieth century. Um, but you've got your boiler cupboard, and you know your kitchen units are, or your bathroom are probably built around it. Doing the heat pump thing is a massive big change. You're looking at huge repairs and things like that. And the key thing about heat pumps, although they are used in some countries like Norway routinely, countries where they have particularly very cold temperatures, and so homes are very well insulated. Uh, the average British sort of terraced home wasn't built like that to withstand that sort of cold or heat, um, and therefore the heat pumps don't work very well at all, do they? Well, it's not just a British problem. The German Greens, who are like the you know, most uh, ardent proponents of heat pumps in Germany, they have, been now, uh, they have now been trying for three years to install a heat pump in their party central in Berlin. It cost five million euros and it's still what? not working. I'm sorry, what? what? But, yeah, it, it's, still, it's <laughs> still not working because, as you correctly point out, there are some older buildings uh, in urban centres, right? The conditions for heat pumps are not there. And the other thing that I think at some point we have to talk about is we are constantly trying to shift electricity to areas like heating, like, like yeah. driving. But we entirely forget we will need even more electricity for the AI revolution and We've got to lack that at some point. Uh, and this is the key thing, isn't it? Because we've seen, this is again and again, we've seen, so the, the, you know, the, the, the heating uh, industry basically saying, look, people don't want these things. We can't persuade people. Uh, the government has already decided to sort of basically row back a little on some of the fines that we're going to give to the heating industry to basically say, look, if you, you, know, if you don't provide X percentage of, of, of your, um, your, your heating units as heat pumps, then you're going to have a fine. I mean, huge fines in the thousands of pounds for each one you, you, you haven't sold. That would just be passed on to everyone else getting a new boiler. We all know getting a new boiler is incredibly expensive. Um, these, these fines that were going to go on uh, motoring uh, companies, man motoring manufacturers, um, this 2030 rule that was being pushed back by the Tories, not pushed back by Labour, in terms of the, you know, whether you're allowed to sell hybrid, diesel or petrol cars that are new on the forecourt and you have to basically sell only EVs. And, and again, the car manufacturer said, no one wants to buy them. We can't sell these things. And governments are, weighing, are rolling back. Now, you and I discussed this for quite some time. Every single policy of net zero, as a whole, you say, are you in favour of net zero in the environment? Everyone goes, oh, yeah, 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 I absolutely care massively about it. Should the government do more? Yes, absolutely. 
But whenever there is a policy that supposedly gets us anywhere towards it, as that policy hoves into view, starts costing us money or imposing changes on us that we don't necessarily want, people go, oh, no, thanks. Is there a single net zero policy that survives uh, basically the reality check of the cost and the impact on people's lives? No, I mean, it's a little bit like saying we want to bring down, you know, death and traffic accidents to zero. The most eff efficient way to do this would be to ban cars. Yeah. Um, but of course, then you would live with the consequences of banning cars. This is what the politicians don't want to admit. It's a trade-off. Um, if you say you want to reach net zero to save the planet, which it wouldn't, that's one thing. But to <laughs> claim you want to reach net zero and you will be better off economically, I think that's really the lie that they're telling. And, as you and people signed out, up to it on the basis they weren't yeah. told that. But we know it's going to cost more. And as you say, small point worth making, oh. isn't going to the save the The bottom planet. line is a simple one. If a technology is really superior and cheaper, people will pick it up on their own and they don't yeah. need government support or subsidies for it. If the EV is better, people will buy it. Yeah. If heat, heat pumps are the better economic choice, people will do it. But it turns out it is not, which yeah. is why the government needs to subsidise. Uh, yeah, and this is the thing, isn't it, when the subsidies go. Well, let's let's talk about what's happening with uh, the policies when it comes to um, in electric vehicles and like, because we've had some announcements recently about how we're going to, you know, be, be going to, to a, a more, more technology around for getting more electricity that is green, um, but also, oh, they're going to be building some, some nuclear power stations, some gas-fired stations, and, and trying to keep that going. But the reality is... All of these net zero policies do involve us using more electricity as opposed to fossil fuels. But we haven't got reliable electricity from solar power and wind power, have we? No, that's correct. And the problem is, of course, that we are constantly look at what was the electricity we used in the past and kind of how can we replace the, pre the previous sources with new ones. But this doesn't take into account additional future needs. Let me give you a very quick example. The United States anticipate that by 2030, uh, the need of electricity for artificial intelligence will quadruple. They will need around, I know numbers are sometimes uh, tricky, but these numbers are, are quite, I think, quite uh, precise. They will need around 370 terawatt hours. What's the, that? What's that that's, in real? No, no, that's, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> the entirety of the UK is producing 310 terawatt hours per year. So the AI sector alone in the United States will need as much electricity in six years from now than all of the UK is producing. Now, I know that the UK wants to be a world leader in AI, but you cannot be a world leader in AI if you don't have electricity for your data centers. Yeah. And as you correctly point out, wind and solar, because they're intermittent, will not be able to continuously provide uh, that electricity yeah. that is needed. But we are not building gas power stations. We won't have enough nuclear power stations, as will pretty much no country in Europe. I mean, certainly uh, the laughable situation, Germany, hilarious. I mean, it's, it is laughable that they basically, we don't like nuclear power. They don't do, they've got rid of all the nuclear power stations, don't build any new ones, but they've got pretty much all the electricity from France. How does France make most of their electricity? I thought I mean, it's nuclear. Nuclear right? power stations. I mean, it is, it's the hypocrisy of all of this. Now, also today, we've had the National Grid, which is a FTSE 100 company. They say they're going to need uh, 60 billion pounds of investment in our power network in new offshore wind farms to hit the government's target to decarbonize the electricity system now by 2035. Labour, they get in, they're going to do it by 2030. Sorry, they say they're going to do it by 2030. It's impossible. Both of these targets are utterly impossible and undesirable to, to hit. They uh, basically they unveil they unveil they're going to unveil their net zero plans on Tuesday. But I mean, how, how are they going to do this without? Huge pylons everywhere. Where are they? Get, are we going to have enough electricity from uh, from wind turbines out in the North Sea? No, even if we would have it, right? The grid is simply not there. It's the problem is the transmission lines, and the second big problem are transformers. If you talk to people in the British industry, for example, they will tell you that ordering a transformer becomes more and more difficult because what people tend to forget, right? It's the thing that kind of gets high voltage down that you can use it in, in in your household. The problem is usually we use them mostly during the day and not so much at night, which means they have a fairly long lifespan. But now with the new proposals, we're going to use them during the day, but we're also going to use them during the night right. for the heat pumps for charging our EVs. Which which means they will be used on basically at the limits for a much longer time, which means that they will break much easier because yeah. they're, they're constantly uh, going at the limit. And we cannot produce them quick enough. So there's this, what is being done, very similar to in other areas as well, and this I think is the, is the devious thing. 
we only look at like a small segment of, of what's going on. But electricity and energy production and provision is a bigger picture and it needs to fit in every element, in every yeah. little bit, a bits and pieces. And there are different pledges being made, but you cannot, you cannot fit it all among all the pledges. And again, small point worth making and something amazed how many MPs don't realise that electricity is only 20% of our energy needs at the current time and it ain't going to change any time soon. No one sensible thinks that. No, it's that. And the other thing that um, always drives me nuts is electricity is, is not a commodity, right? You, you cannot stockpile electricity, and despite what we always oh, hear... Oh, no, I've always been told there. by the Greens, oh, no, but battery storage isn't a problem. No, it's, it's again, electricity is like breathing. You have to do it constantly or everything breaks down. You can't store it up on a sunny exactly, Sunday. Exactly, exactly. For, for a wet Tuesday. If technology is there, right, that's a different story, but I repeat my same mantra every time. Give me a prototype. If we can have a middle-sized British city that runs entirely on batteries, wind and solar, and it works for that city over the period of a year, then we can talk trying to roll it out you know, for all of the UK. But they cannot provide us with a prototype because it doesn't Here's work. Here's the thing. Our politicians are all, I mean, they, they were competing for quite a while for, for, you know, who can be the most green, who can make the biggest offer. And again, we were all told, that, you know, it's half a million green jobs, everything's going to be better and cheaper and wonderful, we're going to be warmer, we want to be warm and cold, we want to be cold, everything's great. We all know that's a lie. We all know it's nonsense. Do you think that the politicians making those promises, whether it's in Austria, your home country, or Germany, or France, or, or Britain, or America, do you think that politicians actually believed it? Were they, were they lied to by their advisers and these supposed like independent green climate advisers who just talk absolute nonsense and don't back it up and no one ever questions them or you just shout denier at them? Um, or, or, or do you think it, it was always a con? Well, I think that many politicians, uh, particularly in Great Britain, probably think that whatever the opinion page of The Guardian says is the reflection of what the people think. And then it's yeah. understandable that you move into these directions. And many of them, I think, neither have the time nor the team of advisors to really understand the intricacies and the complications and yeah. the complexity of the energy system. But very often, just to end the point, they sound, and I hope that this is very shocking in Britain, they sound like the old communists. Right, where they say, it's really hard now, you're going to be poor yeah. now, but I promise tomorrow the promised land of green and, jobs and, and green prosperity And pig iron production up 3,000%. Exactly, yeah. I remember writing A-level history essays about that. Sam Armstrong, let's bring you in. Look, uh, you know, you know a lot of politicians, you work close with a lot of MPs and some who've been speaking out or, or on this issue. Is it your experience that the people who push this genuinely believe that, A, this is about saving the planet and will do, and B... That, that the policies they are pushing will keep the lights on. Yeah, so it has a strange capacity to ensnare people. I mean, Alec Sharma, as far as I knew, was a perfectly sensible chap. He was, you know, uh, a, a perfectly good government minister. He takes the cop job. He goes stark raving so, what, what, what were we, COP26 then? COP20... I don't know. Something. I always thought if you needed one, one more, you needed more than yep. one cop, then it wasn't yeah. going well. And Chris Skidmore. But, and this is a side that goes with it, and you can't ignore it, they do have a strange tendency to take up very high-paid jobs, no. working in the private sector, I'm so benefiting shocked. from precisely these subsidies that I'm they put so in in the first place. Shocked. And this is the thing: there is so much money in this. It's, it is an industry, isn't it? The green industry. And we know that's what you mean about the oil companies and everything's getting involved in it because there's so much money with the subsidies. <laughs> but it is fundamentally, well, it's kind of one big Ponzi scheme, isn't it? Because it's not going to deliver. I mean, look, if in 30, 40, 50 years' time amazing clean energy is developed, we've got the battery storage and we can move to clean energy, 100%, I'll be fully for it. But as you said, like, you know, no one forced people to move from one technology to another when it was moving from the horse and cart to the car. No, and we, 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 ran, that's what we, we ran the experiment. Germany tried the energy transition for 20 years. They are now deindustrializing and in recession. The United States, the Economist recently had an article saying why the United States do not fall into recession. And the reason is because they are fracking at natural gas. If energy is cheap, it underlies, it strengthens the entire economy. This is something yeah. people really need to understand. Energy is not just the sector of the economy, it, it is, is the, the economy. And this is why when people say, oh, isn't it strange the American economy is actually growing very well? I know they've got their own problems, you know, they've had since lockdown, but the, the American economy is growing hugely, and that's because they are now, am I not right, thinking, the biggest energy producer, exporter in the world? They are, they are. And, and we always think it was Saudi Arabia, no, it's America. 
I mean, it's, it's, it's a little bit trickier, but when it comes particularly to the role of natural gas, by the way, which will grow in importance and go down in price because everybody is now drilling for it, which will be the next interesting thing about heating with gas, right? Because once the price is plunged, it would be cheaper for the people as well. But it always comes back to the same point. You cannot have a prosperous growing economy on an energy deficit. And the policies, as you correctly point out, the policies that are being proposed ultimately point towards an energy deficit. It is, it is I mean, it's very terrifying that the people in charge still play along with this madness. Can I just ask you, I mean, I would say it's Putin level. I want to ask you, because I know you're not just uh, an economist and an, an ex expert on this, but also a political theorist as well. Vladimir Putin, sham election, 87% of the vote. Of course, you know, if you imprison uh, or kill everybody who ever stands against you, uh, then easy to get that sort of uh, result. Again, even that's a sham. It's 100%, really, in terms of the people who voted um, Kim Jong-un style. Um, what, what, does, what does that mean? for Europe? What does that mean for the world? Well, that Putin's not going to go away anytime soon. I mean, this, this is... and I'm not an advocate, I'm an analyst. Right? Then we have to say that we were told uh, at least for a while after the outbreak of the war over two years ago that this is going to be over in a few weeks, yeah. that uh, the Russian economy will crumble, that Putin will die, he's sick, he has cancer, and I don't know what the rumours were. Yeah, there'll, be, but, there'll be a revolution against Exactly. It. And none of this has materialised. So I think we have to look the face and the facts that either this war will grind on for another couple of years, uh, or whatever, whatever the, then the final outcome will be. But I think the idea that Russia is about to crumble anytime soon is not going to happen. And we have also, to be honest here, I looked at the numbers. The United Kingdom at the moment has massively increased its exports to Kyrgyzstan, to Azerbaijan, yeah. to Armenia. So either they have all of a sudden become you know, huge customers of the UK, or it's just exporting to Russia via those states. So again, the West is a little bit, let's say, dishonest in its approach to Russia. The same, by the way, with energy. OK, we no longer buy it from Russia. We buy it from Russia via India. But yeah. ultimately, the Russian economy, it, it's harder for them, we keep but it's not enough to kill them. Yeah. Absolutely. Really good to talk to you. Thank you so much. Always great to get you in the studio. Ralph Scholhammer there. Uh, now, today I'm asking you about Rishi Sunak. Uh, he's urged Tory MPs to stick with him because the economy is going to bounce back. Well, not with higher energy prices, it won't, Ralph. Uh, this is uh, ahead of the next general election. Should they keep Sunak or ditch him for another leader? Give us a call, 0344-499-1000. Text on 8722 or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Zach has done just that and says, who cares? This is a dead party walking. Chris says if they stick with him, they lose. If they change and that new leader actually does some conservative stuff, they may have a chance. Richard says, ditch him pronto. You've also been getting in touch on the phones. Do keep those calls coming in. Let's go to Gareth, who is in Derbyshire. Hello, Gareth. Good morning, Good, morning. Julia. good nice afternoon. Yeah. Late, late night for Gareth. Yeah, yeah, Can I clarify? Yeah. Is yeah, it sunny lost, Derbyshire yeah, so. today? Oh, it's, it's always beautiful in Derbyshire. You know, oh, it's the best place point. on the good planet. Point. So, so Gareth, do you, think, do you want to ditch Sunak or do you think uh, another leader well, will make, make a better hash of it? The, the, the point is that I wanted to make, I mean, I think most Conservative members now who are real realistic about this just want to get it over with. What do you think? We'll we get the election over with? Yeah, we do. We want to. The thing is, it's actually better for the country to have an election in May. And let's face it, you know, Rishi Sunak is, is a reasonable person. He's got a lot of qualities, but he was actually sort of parachuted on the members. Nobody really wanted him. It was like this cabal that they've got in the yeah. Conservative Adopt. After Liz Truss was ousted. Was, are, you, are you a Tory was, party member yourself? Yeah, I am, yeah. And right. we, you know, the point is, is that if we have an election in May, of course, Rishi Sunak gets his chance to show what he's worth and see if he can do it. Because, I mean, if he doesn't go in May, he probably will never get a chance because you've got all the local elections in May. You know, if he gets completely trashed in those, I mean, the members are going to be thinking again about whether it's a good idea for him to yeah, go. I mean, there's no-one's expecting anything but a bad result for the Tories in May, so you think there's going to be a leadership challenge anyway. So he's... But I'm yeah, fascinated by the idea that you don't want... The, I mean, wouldn't it be better to keep the Tories in, if you're a Tory, as long as possible and get them to do some stuff to make the country a better place? I mean, well, this is a mind-blowing uh, idea, isn't it, everyone? We've been waiting for that. I mean, he promised that he was going to do five things in a year. But the, the thing is, it would be better for everybody, really, because councils would like to have an election in the summer because and it's better for the country because we get back onto a rotation. We don't really want to have an election in November. Right. Where the, where the economy is concerned, 
We want some stability. We don't want to be hanging on, you know, in the Now, that, that is, a, that is a good point. A lot of businesses say we'll wait and see what happens. Gareth, thank you so much. From yeah, sunny yeah. Derbyshire there, Gareth, thank you. Great. Coming up Great. after the break, where is Kate Middleton? Apparently, she's been seen at a farm shop in Windsor. This amid online speculation about her health. But do we have a right to see her? That's up next. I'm Julia Harley Brewer, and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to it was have another moved on from era. that. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer. You are with Talk TV. Sam Armstrong still with us. Now, a question has been asked for the last few weeks. Where is Kate Middleton? Well, apparently she's been spotted at a farm shop in Windsor after watching her three children playing sport amid speculation online about her health. What's joining me right now is Royal Commentator Richard Fitzwilliam. Uh, good afternoon to you, Richard. Um, it's interesting, a happy and healthy Kate was spotted out and about for the first time since surgery. We've seen pictures of her, obviously, this pose photograph, there's been all this furore about, which she uh, we, apparently was the one who edited. Uh, we've also seen her uh, on TMZ in America, a shot of her in a car being driven by her mother. But apparently she was out... Um, uh, with, at her favourite farm shop, looking on Lucas said, happy, relaxed and healthy uh, on the visit just a mile from her home in Windsor on Saturday. What's interesting, though, is there are no photos. There are photographs in the papers and online, some of them from this farm, but they are actually a year old. They're not actually of Kate, which makes you wonder that, that no one, no one had a phone there and no one thought of taking a photograph of her, which is unfortunately what she's uh, had to deal with a lot of the time. Um, do you... Do you have any concerns about her health and how the palace is handling all of this? Because surely, after all this for all, she could just pose for a photograph and get it all over and done with 
today? Well, I must certainly have had concerns about the way all this has been handled. I mean, we go back just a week and the news had only just broken that that photograph, charming photograph, which was uh, put on Instagram to celebrate my mothering Sunday. And then, of course, no less than, well, eventually five photo agencies um, refused to disseminate it or withdrew it. So, I mean, obviously this has been something of a crisis and obviously the way it's been handled and especially in editing when you, for example, haven't got your engagement ring and wedding ring and there's been all sorts of material online that uh, we don't need to go into here. But I mean, it's a very difficult time. She's been seriously ill and she's been recuperating. I'm only absolutely delighted that uh, apparently and suddenly according to that photograph my initial response was so uh, she looks fantastic yeah, yes you're but right. let's, let's, i want to move i want to move on from that my god we discussed that ad nauseum uh, uh, last week but this is the thing all that furore over that all of that issue and they're still talking about her you know she's still recovering and she's not back in the public eye now i've never had any issue with the, the, the poor woman which has obviously had a serious operation needs recuperation time leave her alone people saying to me leave her never criticized her for that i think i say i wouldn't wish being in a well family on my my worst enemy all of that scrutiny uh, people are allowed to have have you know have a have a health ailment and be left on their own but there's been talk at the weekend that, that she that, that she will talk openly about uh, her health issues but it's interesting that suddenly today there has been a spotting on saturday but there are no photographs um wouldn't it just be easier for the palace given how badly this has all been handled for them to just do a quick interview with her, have a little have a little photo that is clearly, you know, new and taken by press association or someone. No, I agree. I mean, one of the problems for all this, and you would have been over it a week ago, but I mean, the fact that two and a half months since Christmas, uh, there was no sighting. <laughs> This was one of the difficulties. Certainly, I think it would have been an idea because I am surprised there are no photographs because we're all potential paparazzi now with the iPhones, as you know. And I mean, it, it would be a good idea. We saw a flash on um, last Monday in Datchet when she was in the car with Prince William. But uh, yes, I mean, I would have thought as soon as possible one of the problems is there was a lot of concern, and particularly when Prince William pulled out of King Constantine's uh, memorial service, and uh, of course he was going to read the lesson, King Constantine was his godfather, he cited a personal matter, and then you had a positive tsunami. I mean, I'm not suggesting the policy should be done far from it uh, because of crazy comments of one sort or another that we've got uh, online, but in fact, of course, as you know, this has been worldwide news and uh, taken very seriously, the issue of credibility and trust with reference to those photographs. Well, those are I'm serious delighted. issues. But the point is, this was like, you know, it's a forced fault, and then they've been able to, unable to get back on the front foot. Now, look, online conspiracy theories about everything to do with Kate's health, King Charles's health, um, that Kate and William's marriage, you name it. Horrible, nasty stuff, nasty speculation. Um, we, we've no idea, you know, wh you know, where these rumours start, where they stop and things. But the point is, the palace needs to be in control of it. Now, we know they work very closely with, you know, the royal editors and the royal correspondents and editors of national newspapers, because there's a, you know, there's this sort of quid pro quo, we'll give you a picture of us on the day of our, you know, our ski holiday, and then you leave us alone for the rest of it and things like that. But they can't do a deal with social media. They can't do a deal with people who run websites, you know, random websites here and there, or indeed with individuals um, you know, posting on Facebook or, or Twitter. That's going to be a problem in the future, isn't it? Oh, it's a perpetual problem. I mean, you've got, uh, I mean, take Twitter. It's completely, it pretends there's some censorship, as far as I can see, it's none at all. And you get the vilest and most gruesome theories. And it's news instantly throughout the world. I mean, there is no real way around this other than the balance between, on the one hand, you want to be open as the king is uh, when he's conducting royal duties, but not royal engagements, because he's unable to, of course, because yeah. of cancer. But then there's absolutely no doubt. You need this balance. You've got to have privacy on the one hand, because, of course, as you pointed out, she is entitled to privacy, absolutely. But on the other hand, you need a certain amount of openness so that people who are genuinely fond of her, for example, yeah. concerned about uh, what's uh, going on. And, and, yeah. and that balance is really hard to get. It would certainly 
certainly a beer right now. Richard Fitzwilliams, thank you so much, uh, Royal Commentator Richard Fitzwilliams. Thank you. Uh, still with me is Sam Armstrong. Look, you do PR. Mm -hmm. That's what you do. You you handle sort of political uh, PR. Um, but the you know, Royal Family is political PR. What would you do if you were them? Well, right now, I think Kate has to come out. We have to see her. I, I, I appreciate that's difficult. I appreciate they never want to respond, they never want to react. But this vacuum is dangerous. And of course, into the midst of that, what do we have so helpfully? Our good friends from California yes, deciding I was just going to, to mention them. monetize their uh, royal connections once more. The Duchess of Sussex's Instagram comeback to promote her latest business venture, a lifestyle brand called, and these, I think these words have just been chosen randomly, American Riviera Orchard. What a load of abject nonsense. Well, she's got form in that regard. But uh, <laughs> yeah, this is the problem though. If, if the royal family, and this is the slight difficulty with King Charles's slim down monarchy, if you lose two, three members of the family, which is what's happened. You've got anyone left. You've got no one left. Yeah. You can't fill the newspapers. And if you're not telling a story, somebody else is. And, and that's the thing, you've got to fill that void. I mean, again, it was bad enough when you suddenly had, you know, 24 hour news, hello, work in that. But then, then when you've got social media as well, that adds to the pressure. And then, oh, what a surprise. Yeah, Megan, Megan jumps in, who, by the way, was going to be uh, keeping her distance from social media until there's money in them dar hills and then she is back but there we are um always so great to have you on the show sam armstrong thank you very much you go back and advise some tory mps goodness knows that that's a hard job uh, sally we have come to the end of this show thank you so much for tuning in please do join me same time tomorrow up next it's kevin and alex have a great afternoon i'm julia hartley Brewer, and you're with talk tv Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. floor.